This October 10th, 2023 uh, regular school board meeting will come to order. This is not it. Ms. Tolan has submitted a written request to attend virtually this. This is not it. The fourth wall comes down. It's scripted, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, five. I have it. You got it. No. You have mine just ready. Good. Ready. Okay. In order to comply with section 2-23712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on October 12, 2023, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Ms. Omesh, do I have a second? Ms. Corbett Sanders. All those in favor? Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Darnett Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and myself. Uh, all those opposed, abstentions, the motion passes. I call on Ms. Uh, Corbett Sanders for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move to grant in part the school reassignment appeal of a student who to confirm, uh, I'm missing part of the motion, I apologize. Hold on one moment, I will go get it. One, I apologize. All right, we'll take just a moment. everybody I move to grant in part the school reassignment appeal of a student thank you you are all right we're gonna try this all over again <laughs> this never happened <laughs> this October 12th 2023 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now again come to order. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence and a performance of the National Anthem by the West Springfield High School Orchestra students. I pledge allegiance to the flag Mr. Frisch, may I be recognized? Go ahead, Ms. Cohen. Thank you. I wanted to take the opportunity that during tonight's moment of silence, many of our board members would like to share our care and concern for the victims, their loved ones, and our entire Jewish community who are suffering from Saturday's vicious terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel. We further extend our care and concern for all civilians in Israel 
Gaza and the surrounding areas who may be impacted by the ensuing war. Additionally, we wish to reaffirm that anti-Semitism, hate, and Zionism have no, xenophobia have no place in our schools and will not be tolerated. I now call Mr. on Ms. Frisch, Corbett I'd Sanders like to be for a motion. Go ahead, Ms. Omesh. Thank you. Um, I wasn't expecting what seemed to be a sneak attack after we had discussed uh, making sure we represent all children in the ways that we speak and when we speak. Um, so it's disappointing that my colleagues would do that behind my back after conversations that I had with them um, in, in saying that a statement represents everybody's views. Um, but many are thinking about the incredible devastation and human suffering unfolding today in Israel and Palestine, and we mourn the loss of hundreds of innocent civilians killed and homes destroyed this week alone, and the thousands over the decades, all of whom should have been prevented. It might seem simple, aggressors attacking families in a state seeking vengeance, but we often sympathize with and humanize the side that we relate to and the side that looks more like us or that our biases guide us towards. But doing so obscures the root of the violence. Centuries of human history teach us that escalations happen when problems are ignored, realities are denied, and voices are censored, when one narrative dominates from the world stage all the way to our classrooms. We do our students no favors by calling for peace and being unwilling to back what peace requires. As the old civil rights adage goes, no justice, no peace. When we're unwilling to call out the global human rights what global human rights organizations have called an apartheid regime of occupation that has been violating international agreements year after year and killing thousands of innocent civilians over decades, we are lying to our children. When we don't give space to hear the Palestinian narrative, we buy into a rhetoric that negates not only the humanness of Palestinians, but justifies the indiscriminate retaliation against the population. When we show inconsistent outrage that suggests some lives matter more, when Palestinian flags are banned and many in our classrooms are allowed to hold flags for others, when we shut school events down because they include stories of Palestinian students, when humanitarian campaigns by student governments in our system for Palestinian children are shut down because principals deem them controversial after parents complain that Palestinians are terrorists, when teachers are written up for teaching the full context warned that they might, it might threaten their position or are reprimanded for sharing a get-to-know-me board with a Palestinian flag on it, 
then we allow only the occupier's narrative to exist and teach a filtered version of history that fosters dehumanization and hatred, allowing horrors to unfold in the darkness. After all, one-sidedness is what allowed the occupation to continue and it's what facilitated this humanitarian crisis and escalation today. Meanwhile, misinformation, often, often called atrocity propaganda as a phenomenon, is flying around. I'll let you continue, but please wrap it up as verified by statements taken back even by the White House and the Washington Post. While many feel helpless, we can act by advancing the very mission of FCPS, and that's education, to listen to multiple perspectives, to, to familiarize ourselves and be truth seekers. We're an institution dedicated to enlightening our young people. Schools are where students must gain a vast set of perspectives, where they deserve to learn complex truths that equip them for the world they will inherit. If we actually seek to achieve the peace we all deserve and desire, let us not suppress narratives of the occupied. Let us support one another through this tough time by humanizing the other and holding space for those vast experiences. Let us avoid these moments once and for all by preparing all ch our children effectively for a world that so desperately needs just and informed leaders. And finally, I'm not naive enough to think that saying this simple for the, that saying this is simple or won't subject me to hate or smears. But I also have the privilege of life and of voice. And for that, I cannot justify my silence. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. Ms. Corbett Sanders, you have a motion. And Ms. Cohn will make available the statement that was read um, that has the support of 75% of this board uh, after the meeting. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, Chair. I move to grant, in part, the school reassignment appeal of a student who assaulted a staff member at school and to modify the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Is there a second? I'll second. Ms. Merrill. Oh. All those in favor? Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Cohen, and myself, and Ms. Darinette Koufax. Uh, nope. All right, we're going to try that one more time since people are coming back to the table. All those in favor of the motion, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Omesh, and myself. All those opposed? Dr. Anderson, Ms. Dernat Koufax, and Ms. Cohen. Any abstentions? Ms. Marin. Uh, the motion passes. Ms. Sizemore Heiser and Ms. Keith Gamara have submitted a written request to virtually attend this evening's meeting due to personal conflicts. All those in favor of approving Ms. Sizemore Heiser's request, please raise your hand. Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernat Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, and myself. There were uh, any abstention or op opposition? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, welcome, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. If you could test your microphone, she may not be on. She is not currently All right, on. We will check in later. Um, all those in favor of approving Ms. Keys Gamara's request? Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Darinette Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, and myself. That's unanimous. Uh, Ms. Keys Gamara, if you test your microphone. Hello, everybody. We hear you loud and clear. All right. Um, if you'd like to review a copy of the agenda uh, and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information may be found at the back of the auditorium or the website at fcps.edu slash school board slash board docs. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast on channel 99 and live streamed on the, FC, uh, the website at fcps.edu slash tv slash ch99. After reading tonight's proclamations, the board would like to invite those in support of the proclamations to join us for a photo. I call on Dr. Anderson for a proclamation. Thank you. Whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is recognized on September 15th <clears throat> through October 15th across the United States and in Fairfax County Public Schools to celebrate the histories cultures and contributions of Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas this observation was started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week 
under President Lyndon Johnson. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan expanded the observation period to 30 days starting September 15th and ending on October 15th and enacted it into law. And whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is a wonderful opportunity for our schools and community to celebrate various cultures and traditions and a tangible reinforcement of the school board's belief that our diversity is a strength that creates resilient, open, and innovative global citizens. And whereas in FCPS, one in four of our students is, Hispanic, is of Hispanic heritage and boasts ancestry from a variety of countries and cultures. These cultures in turn enrich our own school community. And whereas FCPS values its diversity and acknowledges that all people contribute to the well-being of the community. FCPS is fortunate to have many groups whose members work with our Latino students, empowering them to be the next generation of leaders and professionals. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board, on behalf of the students, educators, and families of Fairfax County Public Schools, does hereby proclaim October 2023 as National Hispanic Month and in Fairfax County Public Schools, the Fairfax County School Board encourages all to participate in programs and events taking place in our schools and community to learn about, celebrate, and elevate this rich heritage. Is there a second? Yo segundo. <laughs> Ms. Marin. Dr. Anderson, would you like to speak to your proclamation? Yes, I would. Um, first, I would like to thank the Fairfax County Hispanic Educators Association for inviting me to their celebration last week. I was there with Ms. Tolan and had the opportunity to really spend some time with Dr. Ponce. And we were, I was very grateful and really, it was just such a moment for me to partake in some of the food that was there that just really brought me back to my childhood. Um, I will not say what it is because I know I will not get the name correct, but it was just so nice to connect because it also shows the tapestry of um, all of our cultures. So that was a wonderful opportunity that I really wanted to highlight here this evening. Um, in our schools, diversity is our strength. And this month is our opportunity to amplify Hispanic voices, histories, and contributions. Let's foster understanding, appreciation, and unity as we embrace the vibrant stories that shape our collective identity. Let us take this opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments, resilience, and talents of Hispanic and Latino students, educators, and families who enrich our schools. And of course, Dr. Ponce among us represents that by fostering an environment that embraces diversity and empower our students to become global citizens and appreciate the richness of different perspectives. May this month serve as an inspiration and a reminder for us to continue creating inclusive spaces where every student feels heard, seen, and valued. And I also encourage us to look beyond the things that we typically um, associate with diverse cultures, such as food and dances. Let's engage into their traditions, their cultures, their values, and let's also highlight and, and, and empower them to share those with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to your second? I'll just add that I'm so grateful that we get to celebrate this because of the beautiful diversity that we have among our students and staff. And I do want to give a shout out to the Hispanic Educators Association and the Hispanic Leadership Alliance, which does amazing work in building a network among educators and also providing very generous scholarships to our students in the spring. And I try as hard as I can to get that information into our school so our students know about those resources. So thank you, educators, for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Omesh. Thank you. I'm happy to follow and appreciate Dr. Anderson's remarks, um, as well as Ms. Marin's. As many of my colleagues have mentioned, Spanish is actually our division's second most widely spoken language. Um, the, the, in our recent census in this county, nearly a fifth of our a population is Hispanic or Latino, uh, and we should be proud of this growing diversity within our country and within our schools. I want to highlight that a number of our schools, and I don't know that we even realize this, uh, are more than half majority minority, uh, Hispanic or Latino, and se in Braddock Elementary, for example, 75% of the student population be belongs to a Spanish-speaking family. 
Students have made virtual pen pals with Guatemalan students to share their learning, expanding our students' global understanding. And it's important to recognize, of course, that amongst this beautiful diversity, uh, we celebrate figures like Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor, of course, as a student of the law, I appreciate her in particular, but even people like Dr. Julio Palmas, who surprisingly invented the CAPTCHA that makes sure you're not a robot when you fill out forms, um, and, and so many others. Uh, but of course that there was struggle as well. President Herb Herbert Hoover, for example, scapegoated Mexican Americans for the Great Depression and deport deported approximately two million Americans of Mexican heritage to Mexico. And in the 1970s, Latina women were disproportionately targeted for coer and coerced into sterilization. I bring up, of course, some of the harrowing history that maybe we're not taught to celebrate the triumph that the community has, has uh, come through uh, and of course to uh, celebrate Her this Hispanic Heritage Month with so many in our system, like my friend Dr. Manuel P Gomez Portillo and so many others uh, from organizations like the Hispanic Educators Association, Lupe, the Leadership Alliance, as Ms. Marin mentioned, uh, and others. So happy Hispanic Heritage Month to everyone. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Uh, Ms. San Corbett Sanders. Yes, um, one of the beauties about our culture and our society here in Fairfax County is that so many of our families celebrate multiple identities. And um, some of you may know that I have uh, six Hispanic um, nieces, nephews, and grandnieces, and a um, sister-in-law. But the, it's not a monolithic group. The beauty of our Hispanic heritage is that people come from multiple locations around the world, not only the Central American and South American locations, but also in uh, Europe. And each one has its own culture, celebrations, um, and r holidays and recognitions. And so I'm just thrilled that we have recognized that and recognized that it takes more than just a week to, uh, to celebrate and to um, bring a light onto this culture. And I also just want to take a point of privilege. My um, grandniece is celebrating her quinceanera on Saturday night, so I'm looking forward to uh, participating in that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Seeing no others uh, with their lights on, we will go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor of the proclamation? Okay, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Dernat Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and myself. Uh, Ms. Kiskamara, I can't see you on the screen, unfortunately. I'm raising my hand. Okay, and Ms. Kiskamara, uh, that's everyone in attendance. The, the proclamation passes. I call on Ms. Cohen for a proclamation. Whereas Indigenous Peoples Day and Native American Heritage Month are recognized on the second Monday of October and throughout the month of November, respectively, across the United States and in Fairfax County Public Schools to honor and celebrate the history and accomplishments and contributions of people who were the first inhabitants of the United States. And whereas in 1990, Congress passed and President George W. Bush signed into law a joint resolution designating the month of November as the first National American Indian Heritage Month. In 2021, President Joe Biden was the first U.S. president to formally commemorate Indigenous Peoples Day as a national holiday with a presidential proclamation. And whereas Indigenous Peoples Day and Native American Heritage Month are wonderful opportunities for our school and community to honor our nation's original inhabitants and their descendants, the invaluable contributions that indigenous people have made to the arts, public service, military service, and other fields are integral to our nation. And whereas FCPS serves a diverse student population with many who embrace and celebrate their indigenous family heritage. Now therefore be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board does hereby proclaim October 9th, 2022, as Indigenous Peoples Day, and November as Native American Heritage Month in recognition and celebration of the many contributions of our nation's indigenous people to our school system, community, and country. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Is there a second? Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Cohen, would you like to speak to your motion? 
I feel really honored to have the opportunity to present this. Uh, it's maybe particularly poignant um, in this moment in history. And instead of using my words, I just wanted to lift up the words of um, a few um, Native Americans who've given their perspective on this day. Mr. Erwin Morris says, every day is Indigenous Peoples Day. Every time that the sun rises and we are still here is cause for celebration. Raven Carlson said, we deserve more than just one day. We deserve the entire year and that's what we get. Every single day we are still here and thriving and that's what this day means. To show the rest of the world that wanted us dead so badly they didn't win. This day reminds them that they never will win. We are here and stronger than ever, honoring our ancestors that came before us, those who thought they'd be their last generations. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. McLaughlin, would you like to speak to your second? I would, and um, it's tough to follow Ms. Cohen's um, beautiful words just now, but I, I would like to specifically elevate um, a revered Native American in our history, Jim Thorpe. Um, Jim Thorpe was an athlete that was highly regarded as one of our finest in the 20th century. He, his athletic achievements included two gold medals in the pentathlon and decathlon in the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden. He also played football, baseball, and basketball professionally and was inducted into the Professional uh, Hall, Football Hall of Fame in 1963. Sadly, he suffered tremendous persecution as a Native American throughout his life, despite his athletic prowess. His Olympic medals were revoked in 1913 after it was discovered that he had played minor league baseball, which is against the Olympic rules at the time. In 1983, his medals were thankfully reinstated posthumously. He was a strong supporter of Native American rights and strove to increase awareness and respect for his people's history and traditions. He was also a role model and a guide to other Native American athletes. James Thorpe continues to be celebrated today as a pioneering athlete and a Native American rights crusader. His legacy continues to inspire sportsmen and others from all walks of life to follow their dreams and to fight for what they believe in. It is an honor to uplift him this evening, and I hope that we will always strive to continue to better understand the countless indigenous people um, who have helped shape our nation and our world today. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Omesh. Thank you. Um, as we acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day, I am sure there are mixed feelings, and I've, um, I know in the community we celebrate on the one hand, but we recognize a very painful history and a reality that we live in today um, where essentially we've colonized a land um, and taken it from its people. There's no doubt so much beauty. Uh, in the state capital of Richmond, there is a memorial that recognizes and celebrates the 11 state-recognized tribes, uh, and w Virginia is actually home to over 125,000 um, Native uh, Americans. Um, but of course, I would challenge each of us to look beyond Jamestown and beyond the history that we've been taught. The numerous contributions from the ad advent of topical pain relief um, to even sports like the uh, tools like the kayak, um, and hopefully when we enjoy these benefits, even like a hammock, the next time we're enjoying it on a lazy Sunday, to recognize that these are real traditions that came from a people that were essentially eradicated in a genocide that killed over 12 million people in this country. Um, and I, I, you know, I have to say, I was recently at the Renwick Gallery, which I would highly encourage everybody to go to, uh, right in front of the White House where there's a lot of revival of Native American art and an appreciation for the real feelings and experiences of people um, to, to, to reflect on, you know, I'm still deconstructing and reflecting on the pains of the colonial experience that ultimately resulted in that genocide and required de dehumanization, the narratives around what we're taught, um, and, and uh, thinking about just the, the reality of what was and what could have been. Um, and the U.S. creating tropes about Indian savages and barbarians who were inherently prone to violence at the time. Lessons for us to learn from today, uh, but certainly a heritage as well to celebrate um, and to uplift. And I hope that we can continue teaching truth in our schools um, and, and uh, casting light on the realities of what these people experienced. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Marin. 
Yes, when we talk about and advocate for teaching truth, this is the kind of truth that we talk about. And um, I, have, I appreciate uh, Ms. McLaughlin talking about Jim Thorpe. I recently read a biography about him. And I also read the Indigenous People, uh, People's History of America. And they haunt me because I wonder, did I just not like know that or why don't I know that and why isn't it deliberately taught? So this is what our charge has been to the superintendent to be sure that we are learning about the robust history of people um, in North America and, and everywhere, uh, certainly using resources like the Smithsonian. And I believe we do have partnerships that do that kind of work, but it is imperative that we um, expand what has traditionally been taught and include the whole history, the whole beautiful and sometimes ugly history for our students to know and learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin. No other lights on. We will go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor of the proclamation, please raise your hand. Ms. Cor Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernak Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Amesh, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Kiskamara, will you verbalize? We can't see you on the screen. Sorry. Ms. Yeah. Oh, all right. Ms. Kiskamara. Uh, all opposed? Abstentions? It passes. Thank you. Um, you can mute yourself now. Okay, great. Um, item 307, LGBTQIA History Month Proclamation. I call on Ms. Corbett Sanders for a proclamation. Thank you, Vice Chair. Whereas LGBTQIA History Month is recognized in October across the United States and in Fairfax County Public Schools to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions and experiences of too often overlooked or silenced LG LGBTQIA plus people, communities, and movements throughout our history and whereas the special month was founded in 1994 by Missouri High School history teacher Rodney Wilson, who chose October for the inaugural celebration to coincide with National Coming Out Day in October, uh, on October 14th, and to commemorate the first march on Washington for LGBTQIA plus rights in October of 1979. And whereas the national PTA states that schools should be a safe, supportive, and respectful environment for all students, and that LGBTQIA plus students are more likely than their peers to be bullied, feel unsafe in school, and skip school due to safety concerns, and whereas students are involved in Gender Sexuality Alliance GSA clubs at many middle and high schools throughout Fairfax County Public Schools, where they can network and socialize with each other and educate their communities through forums, announcements, and other activities, and these clubs are an asset to our schools with research indicating that schools with GSAs have better mental health outcomes for all students. And whereas the Fairfax County School Board celebrates its richly diverse community of LGBT, LGBTQIA plus students, families, and staff, recognizes the urgency of its charge to foster a school community where all feel valued, supported, and hopeful, and advances policies that protect LGBTQIA plus students and staff so they can live without fear of prejudice, discrimination, or violence. Now therefore be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board, on behalf of the students, educators, and families of Fairfax County Public Schools, does hereby proclaim October 2023 as LGBTQIA plus History Month in Fairfax County Public Schools and the Fairfax County School Board urges all to learn more about the many historic and, con and contemporary contributions and experiences of this diverse community and to build a culture of inclusivity and equity, not only during LGBTQIA plus History Month, but throughout the entire year. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Is there a second? I second. Ms. Bakarski, Ms. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to your, mo your proclamation? Yes, uh, Chair Frisch. Our, procla our proclamations are a way of having our staff, students, and community members feel valued, seen, included, and hopeful. It is why we spend about an hour of every meeting talking about the important constituencies that this school system shares and serves. It is critical that we do this 
because so often our children don't feel like they have a voice or are seen by so many. And oftentimes, individual children or groups of children are politicized. And we don't want to do that. We want to ensure that our community is safe and nurturing and welcoming. And that's why we do these proclamations. It's also really important for our children and our staff and our allies to understand how many contributions members of the LGBTQIA community have made, not only here in Fairfax County or on this board, but also um, in our history. And so I wanted to just briefly give you three names to remember. One is Alan Turning, who played such an important role as the father of computer science and decoder, whom without him, we would have had an extended World War II. It was because of his decoding uh, expertise and his work with computers that we were able to defeat Nazi Germany and end the Holocaust. We also have Barbara Giddings, whom successfully led the charge to remove sexuality as a disorder from the American Psychiatric Association's designation list. So important because it's critical that we know that this is not a disorder. This is how people can be recognized as their authentic selves. And finally, we do want to remember Sally Ride, the first female astronaut whom also was a member of this community. So I ask all of my, all of my colleagues to share with me the importance of recognizing and including this month. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Ms. Pekarski, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, of course. I think tonight is a night where we are um, showcasing uh, many underrepresented groups of people um, that have often been forgotten in our history um, and, and not taught to our students. We are a very diverse school community, and our children should see themselves um, in our curriculum and should learn about people um, that are like them, and I, that's why I'm, I'm happy to second this motion um, tonight. And when I thought about what I wanted to share, um, really all I could think about was that we are now, in this point in time, writing our own chapter, in many ways, um, in LGBTQ history. According to the ACLU, in the last few years, many states, including ours here in Virginia, have advanced a record number of bills to restrict rights for LGBTQIA plus youth. Threats of violence against this youth com community are on the rise and intensifying, according to a briefing by the Department of Homeland Security in May, um, presented in May 2023. I share those concerns and the angst that many um, have, and today I had the honor of participating in an Oakton High School Candidates uh, Day forum where um, you know, many people running for public office were able to come, talk to students, students were able to interact with us, and this was one of the main questions I was asked um, by our youth. This is on their mind, this is of concern, and that's why right now um, it is so very important that um, we elevate LGBTQIA history and the many, many contributions folks in this community have made to make this world a better place. And that continues. We are part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. Ms. Omesh. Thank you. I'm happy to follow the sentiment of my colleagues um, in uplifting various minorities. Uh, last meeting, I pushed for us to expand our thinking around how we equitably, sec equitably secure representation for vulnerable students. We need to fight for kids in a way that's sustainable, and by being thoughtful as leaders about how boundaries among various groups interact, we can honor all kids and secure their interests for the long run. Learning history is different from endorsement or celebration of its events and outcomes, which we know cannot be expected nor imposed. And with that in mind, it is critical to raise young leaders who have a deep understanding and awareness of the vast diversity of thought and expression that exists in our world. 
LGBTQ people and their struggles have been part of America's history and our collective story. Their fights for rights and inclusion over the last several years involved intergenerational struggles and have had broad impacts on how we view our world today. It's important to expose students to difference without a partiality for or against that makes them unsafe being themselves in the classroom. I'll be voting for this motion because this month has potential to promote tolerance through the visibility to do that. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Cohen? I wanted to take the opportunity to, um, to honor our, the history that we get to make um, on this board and honor um, the gentleman who's acting as chair tonight. Um, Carl Frisch was the first openly um, gay person on our board in Fairfax County, the first openly gay elected official to be elected in this county. Yeah. Um, one of the first openly gay elected officials um, in all of Northern Virginia um, and in Virginia proper. And I have to say, as his colleagues, we benefit every day from the insight that we get. Um, as on a personal note, I would never have felt able to come out myself um, if Carl had not been um, an encouragement, a support, um, and someone who will always pick up the phone um, when any of us need help and guidance and, um, and care and comfort. So thank you, and I feel awfully proud that this board had the opportunity um, to have a little part in our own LGBTQ history. So thanks, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Mrs. Cohen. <laughs> um, Ms. McLaughlin. I know we are trying to um, avoid every board member speaking to every proclamation. So um, I will just briefly say that uh, as a very proud mother of my gay son, um, I think that this is an extraordinarily important recognition that we are doing. Um, we need for every uh, child and our community to understand the tremendous contributions that our LGBTQIA community has brought to the history of this nation. And um, when we have that opportunity, as we talk about, whether it's women's history, um, black history, um, and this history, uh, it is elevating the various heroes we've had over the centuries who've fought to what I believe continues to be um, a more perfect union every day um, that even the 12 of us uh, have sat here and tried to do together over the last four years. So, um, Ms. Cohen, thank you for um, uplifting the fact that uh, we are continuing to try and uh, make our, our county and our country move forward in many positive ways, including the representation we have here tonight. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Derenek Koufax? Yes, I too will be brief. I want to just say that this is work that we have done through the years to make sure our LGBTQIA plus students feel safe, secure, and supported is something that I've supported, this board has supported. Um, we are proud of our work, and we want you to know that uh, we will always be there for you, and we will have your backs, and um, we thank you for working together with us to ensure that um, this group of students feels, as, as I said, safe, supported, and secure in our schoolroom. Thank you, Ms. Darinette Koufax. Seeing no other lights on, I will take a moment to correct Ms. Cohen. Um, I am the first LGBTQ school board member in Fairfax County that we know of. Um, though I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> um, whether or not we recognize that history is happening every second of every day. And the history of LGBTQ people is complicated because we have always existed. Every religion, every culture, every race, every ethnicity, every way that you can divide a population, you will find queer people in it. Even people who divide themselves into a population that say there are no queer people. They're just not telling you. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are they silenced? Are their contributions recorded? 
Were they exterminated? Why don't we know about their contributions to our history? And I think a lot about the situation that we're in as a country. We protect our LGBTQIA kids in Fairfax County Public Schools, but that doesn't mean that they're not hearing the conversation happening beyond the walls of our schools from politicians who should know better than to bully children. And that has an impact. The year I was born in 1978, <laughs> as the kids say, the late 1900s, um, there was a ballot measure in California where I was born to prohibit LGBTQ people from teaching in public schools and to prohibit anyone who supported them from working in public schools. It did not pass, thankfully, but ballot measures like that passed all over the country. And so when we see work in Florida and in Richmond and elsewhere that says, hey kiddos, don't tell anyone who you are. We will not keep you safe. In fact, we will make you less safe. A different kind of history is being made. And every single one of us has a choice of which side of that divide we're gonna be on, which part of the history we're gonna be on. Are we gonna be the people that are praised in the history books or are we gonna be the people that are looked at as being on the wrong side of history? I am grateful for every single person on this board who has worked to protect our LGBTQIA students because they haven't always had protection on this board, but this board and more recent boards have been there for them. And we have to continue to be there for them. As long as politicians look at polling and decide that picking on one group of kids is gonna win them votes. To the kids watching at home, who are smart enough not to be here at this hour, we like to say you're seen, you're heard, whatever. We've got your back. And we wanna know when we're coming up short. So come use that microphone. Flood our inboxes, contact us, let us know how we're doing. Thank you. I will call for the vote. All those in favor of the proclamation? Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernat Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Keys Gamara? Yes. In favor? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Keys Gamara, all opposed? Any abstentions? The proclamation passes. All right. Uh, number Three, uh, agenda item 3.08, School Principals, Administrators, and Administrative Assistance Month Proclamation. I call on Ms. Derenak Koufax for, for the proclamation. Thank you. Whereas the celebration of School Principals, Administrators, and Administrative Assistance Month honors elementary, middle, and high school leaders and support staff and recognizes their roles are essential in preparing students for success both during their pre-K through 12 years and beyond. And whereas principals serve a variety of critical roles, such as instructional leaders, community builders, assessment experts, budget analysts, facility managers, public relations experts, guardians of various legal, contractual, and policy mandates. They set the academic tone of their school by setting ambitious goals, enforcing rigorous standards, and maintaining high curriculum standards and expectations for all students. And whereas dedicated and inspiring school administrators work collaboratively with students, families, teachers, and the community. Their leadership is second only to classroom instruction amongst all school-related factors that contribute to what students learn at school. And whereas the important work of office assistance and administrative assistance is central to any school, these assistants keep their office and school operations organized and efficient. Whereas these educational leaders and support staff are dedicated in supporting and educating our students, and it is through their perseverance and passion that FCPS Public Schools continues to produce career-ready students. Now for, be it resolved, 
that the Fairfax County School Board recognizes October 2023 as School Principals, Administrators, and Administrative Assistance Month and the importance of school leadership and support in ensuing every child has access to a high quality education. Thank you, Ms. Darinette Koufax. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Omesh. Ms. Darinette Koufax, would you like to speak to your proclamation? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Frisch. I am thrilled to make this motion to honor all of our elementary, middle, and high school principals, administrators, and administrative assistants this month, not really just this month, but throughout the entire year. These professionals are true leaders. They are the backbone in each of our schools. Many times you see them out supporting students, walking the halls, welcoming parents, and attending after hours events. But what you may not see is the tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to help bring academic excellence to our students. They're not just leaders, they are organizers, planners, communicators, and relationship builders. Each of their roles is unique, the principal, administrators, and our administrative assistants, but together they are a team in our schools. They mentor, they motivate, and they lead and build relationships between teachers, parents, and guardians. They together as a team with the teachers set the vision for each of our individual schools. So to all our principals, administrators, and administrative assistants, we thank you, we appreciate you, and we know we could not do it without you. Your dedication and hard work is evident each and every day, and our board is honored to take a moment this month to recognize all you do to keep FCPS strong for our students. Thank you, Ms. Darinette Koufax. Ms. Omesh, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, uh, and I wanna thank all the principals, administrators, and administrative assistants in our system, and a special shout out to those who have joined us tonight. I'm going to read off your names and I'll ask you to stand for a royal wave um, and please, and then in the end we'll give you all a round of applause. Um, but starting with our administrative assistants, Esther Baca from Beechtree, Sherry Suknanen from Braddock, Clavaya Sa from Cameron Elementary, Anna Mack from Carl Sandburg Middle, Brenda Meha from Mark Twain Middle, Carla Lobo from Sleepy Hollow Elementary, Brenda Meha from Twain Middle. Oh, that was repeated, sorry. Bridget Louder from Beechtree. Uh, so now we're in APs, assistant principals. Holly Dowling from Braddock. Maureen Lopez from Braddock. Ineda Thomas from Braddock. Amanda Snyder from Cameron Elementary. Sean Frank from TJ Thomas Jefferson. And our principals, Talia Clark from Beechtree. Keisha Jackson uh, from Braddock. Eric Johnson from Cameron Elementary. Zed Jemison from Fort Belvoir Primary Elementary, Elizabeth Beatty from Haycock, Lindsay Kearns from Lake Braddock, Herman Mitzel from Langston Hughes, Elizabeth Watson from McNair, and Sonia Williams from Stone. Please stand up, and if there are others that, that didn't RSVP or I don't have the list, please stand up and be recognized. I'm really glad that we actually expanded the proclamation language to include administrators and administrative assistants as well. And last, yes, round of applause to all of you behind the scenes doing all that grunt work to make our schools run. Um, last year I had talked about the history of principals starting from the beginning of the 20th century, but of course I hadn't mentioned the piece with our administrative assistants, so let's do a take two. Uh, as schools grew from one-room schoolhouses into schools with multiple grades, the need arose for someone to manage the more complex organizations. This need was filled initially by teachers who continued to teach while also dealing with their school's management needs. These teachers, will, teachers were called principal teachers. And as schools grew, principal teachers became full-time administrators in most schools. Most principals soon stopped teaching because of the many demands their management responsibilities placed on their time. And as support staff grew, principals, which include an incredible team of APs, administrators, and AAs who work tirelessly to ensure that student needs are being met and that schools are operating smoothly. And we know too, uh, very often they're friends of our students as well. The FCPS School Board is introducing this resolution to honor these heroes for their visionary leadership and tireless pursuit of success for each student. And we're proud to join the governor when Governor Northam had declared Virginia Schools Principal Appreciation Week 
and I'm also proud that FCP and FCPS were recognizing our outstanding principles and outstanding new principles at our FCPS Employee Awards Ceremony. With this resolution passage, FCPS is proud to celebrate October as national principles and principles and assistant principles and as administrative assistance month. Thank you all so much for all that you do in our schools. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Um, Marin. I'd like to say that I really don't know how you do the jobs that you do. You do so many different things in a day, and I know I was just at Langston this week, and Dr. Mizell, you are a force in the cafeteria. My own daughter comes home and tells me stories about you, which shows that you are a presence. And so I just, I, we, I see your work, and I advocate for your work, and this board is deeply thankful. So thank you for being here after your long day in school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, and I'll be very brief. We often hear it takes a village, and when you look at this proclamation, it, talk, it actually describes the village that makes our schools run without each and every one of you playing a part and being part of the three to succeed for our children. Our schools would not be the excellent centers of our community that they are. And so I very much appreciate you. I thank you and cheer you on. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Dr. Anderson. I would definitely be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say, first of all, um, happy month to school principals, administrators, administrative assistants. This is a wonderful opportunity to recognize you. But I have to speak a little bit to my tribe, you know, the principals, y'all my folks. So I just want to say thank you for all of your work. One of the things that Miss um, Diderot Koufax call, um, talked about in the proclamation were all of the roles that you play in our school divisions. Um, but she forgot a couple, um, which is your chief social worker, you're the cheerleader, you're the lead teacher, you're the manager, you're the substitute teacher, you're the doer of all tasks that are undone or there's not somebody there to do it. And so I'm very appreciative of all of your efforts. Your job is challenging and you do it with a smile for a smile, because that's what we get from our students and parents when they see you doing all of the things possible to advance their students. So thank you as you work to advance my personal children and, and as you work to advance all of the children in Fairfax County. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Pekarski. Yeah, I'm gonna give you all a, a, a gift and I'll keep my comments short so you can get home after a very long day. I will just say thank you. We absolutely have the best of the best. Um, I cannot find uh, uh, an easier way um, to say it than just show you and, and, and convey my deep appreciation. And Miss Williams, wonderful Stone Middle School principal. You survived my own son who's now a freshman, so I know you are a rock star. Thank you. High praise. Uh, Ms. Uh, Cohen. Thanks very much. Uh, I, many of you know that um, I grew up um, as princi the principal's kid, um, and she actually was my elementary school principal. So I have to give a shout out to my favorite principal, uh, Nancy Hoffman. Um, but I also wanted to say I know what your, <laughs> she's pretty great, but um, I know how much your families give. I know your spouses, your significant others, um, I know that the school becomes what you live and breathe, um, whether you're the principal, the AP, the admin assistant. Um, this is what you take home with you at night um, and probably the first thing that you think about when you wake up. And I just want to say thank you to you but also to your families um, because we know that uh, your school becomes a big part of your family. So thank you so much for your dedication. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my kid's principal, um, Miss Lindsay Kearns, who is sitting in the back, and her amazing EAA, Miss Julie Moore, who is incredible, and also uh, Miss Salgado, who is our subschools um, AA and who gets all of my phone calls when my children are sick. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. McLaughlin, go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I, I, I just want to share with all of the um, principals, administrators, and administrative assistants who are here this evening, um, just my deep appreciation as well. Um, my father spent the vast majority of his educational career as a teacher in the classroom. And when he did get his certification to become an administrator, uh, he lasted about three years as an, a vice principal <laughs> and uh, suddenly decided that uh, the, the 12, 12 months and the long hours, um, he was happier back in the classroom, which is where he went back to. So um, I just wanted to kind of share that little uh, levity of um, how much as his daughter, I truly appreciated um, the challenges of what it was like as a class in the classroom teacher, but also the countless hours that are required when you become a, a building administrator and those who support the building administrators. So um, thank you again for everything that you do to help manage and run our buildings. Um, you know, today was a special honor for several of us to be with Principal Lindsey Kearns as Lake Braddock celebrated its 50th anniversary, and uh, she and her team were just remarkable from start to finish. And so I got to see personally today again how much work goes in behind the scenes for all that you do to create a really beautiful community for our students and staff. So my deepest appreciations to all of you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Seeing no other lights, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of the proclamation, please raise your hand. Ms. Cohen, Ms. Amesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernat Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, and myself. Um, all the, and Ms. Keys Gamara? Ms. Keys Gamara. All right, yes. and Ms. Keys Gamara. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes. Um, I've been advised by the parliamentarian that I've not been counting my own vote. It, with the exception of this most recent motion. So without objection, uh, I would like to uh, the record to record uh, that the chair voted yes on proclamations 3.05 through 3.08. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. Oh, I would like to invite uh, those here in support of Hispanic Heritage Month proclamation to please join the board for a photo. And then the clerk will take over with the announcements. Hispanic Heritage. If you're here in support of the Hispanic Heritage Proclamation, please join the board. I would like to invite those here in support of the Indigenous Peoples Day and Native American Heritage Month proclamation to please join the board for a photo.
I would like to invite those here in support of the LGBTQIA History Month proclamation to please join the board for a photo. I would like to, inv uh, to invite school principals, school administrators, and administrative assistants who are here in support of school principals, administrators, and administrative assistants month proclamation to please join the board for a photo. All right. Agenda item 401, community participation. The next order of business is community participation. We, will, uh, we welcome all community members who are here and those who signed up to speak this evening. Community members can sign up to provide comments at school board regular business meetings and public hearings on the school board website. At regular business meetings, speakers may address any school related issue except those that have been scheduled for a public hearing such as the capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Comments targeting, criticizing, or attacking individual students are not permitted during public meetings. Complaints regarding school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school officials. Speakers should not use personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student or school-based employee. 
Additionally, speakers should be respectful and observe proper decorum in their statements, avoiding profanity, inappropriate gestures, shouting, and comments that run counter to the spirit and letter of the school division's non-discrimination policy, which protects students and staff from discrimination based on age, race, sex, color, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, national origin, marital status, or disability. Speakers must limit their remarks to no more than two minutes, direct their comments to the school board, and should remain at the podium until concluding their remarks. Additionally, only the speaker may stand at the podium. They may not be joined by others. Speakers' uh, substitutions are not permitted. A speaker may not yield their time to another individual. At the conclusion of two minutes, the microphone or video will be turned off. School board members will be listening but not responding. We ask audience members to be respectful of one another. Shouting or outbursts will not be tolerated. Audience members should hold their applause until the conclusion of a speaker's remarks and remain at their seats, including when videotaping or taking photos. We are grateful to those who have come to speak to us today and thank you for your cooperation. And I would like to encourage everyone, including myself, my phone went off during the meeting, I apologize. Everybody should silence their phones. Madam Clerk, please call the speaker. Giada Weatherup. Um, can I start? Okay. Hi, my name is Giada Weatherup and I live in Sully District. I'm a freshman at Chantilly High School and I'm here to talk about reducing climate change in FCPS. First off, I want to appreciate and acknowledge all that's already been done. We already have eight up and running electric school buses and are planning to have 30 by the end of the semester. Sadly, that's all that's been done to help reduce emissions so far. As a high school student with anxiety, I already have numerous worries about my future, but in the past years, I've started to worry about our climate change. Staying up late worrying about whether you'll be able to go outside in 50 years isn't exactly good when you have three tests the next day. So I urge you, please focus on school electri electrification. Electrification means no fossil fuels, not just an electric school bus fleet in 12 years. All right, uh, thank you. Vicki Fishman, Cindy Walsh, Killian Kelly, Hi. Uh, 14 months ago, I stood here and shared the deplorable conditions of the Woodson baseball field. It is very frustrating to say I have no good news to report. Only one of you took me up on my offer to visit the field. Two of you have been to Woodson but never looked at the baseball or softball fields. My emails have been ignored. This is FCPS. Facilities toured our field with a contractor. Our infield was only regraded because a contractor commented, quote, I'm surprised nobody has broken a leg at third base. During our games, you can hear rival teams exclaim things like, this field is a, is a bleep hole. This is FCPS, only the best for Woodson, I guess. The, the press box still leaks near the wires. It floods. The dugouts are the original 1960s style. They are smaller than current little league dugouts. Players and coaches do not fit inside the dugout. It's unsafe. Our bleachers are terrible. The bleachers are set on wood planks, jury rigged to prevent them from being lopsided. One false move by a spectator and everyone on the bleachers is now sitting slanted. Yep, totally safe. Our fences are outdated too. Last season, an errant ball hit a spectator on, a head, on the head. It was someone who was coming there to take pictures of the players. This is FCPS. Safety is not a priority at Woodson. Facilities claims it has no money for upgrades. The newer schools have all been remodeled, but we have not. How is this equitable? How do you have at least a million dollars or more to pay for everything involved with a new school name change? Explain to me, the parents, the students, softball players, and baseball players, how they will never have and will not ever get what every other high school in the district has, a field they can be proud of. You pride yourselves on teaching and preaching equity, but where is the equity towards Woodson? Cheryl Binkley. We 
we can build skyscrapers, send people into space, and develop artificial intelligent, intelligence, hold positions of power, and have great wealth or fame, but it is our stories that give meaning to what we do, that, that ask the all-important questions about who we are and what does all our striving mean. Today, people are telling us, don't teach the stories, especially if they are from voices some don't understand. They are divisive. They're too graphic. Aeschylus plays that I have taught many times come to us from thousands of years ago and are foundational to Western literature. We have the story of Oedipus, the hero king, who unaware marries his mother and murders his father. It is a gory, sexually explicit story filled with broken taboos, a nightmare of a king so prideful that he destroys all he loves and ends wandering alone, self-blinded in the wilderness as his kingdom falls into chaos. If turned into a graphic novel, Oedipus is every bit as vividly explicit as the stories being banned today. Yet they have important messages for us both, particularly when those in power are tempted to the same fatal flaw as Oedipus, who refused to learn things. He rejected hearing Tiresias, who knew the things Oedipus did not want to hear. Aeschylus wrote 89 plays. We only have seven. The remainder were lost, burned in the library of Alexandria, when the Christian Bishop Clement called Hypatia, the librarian, a heretic and evil, inspiring his followers to kill her and burn the library. Gina Weatherup. Hello. Uh, my daughter spoke to you earlier about electrifying the schools, something I fully agree with and urge the school system to do as quickly as possible. There are so many important issues that have been brought up tonight, realities of the legacies of colonialism and racism and other awful isms that are a fabric of our lives, the reality and ticking clock of climate change and the need for safer facilities. So why have I signed up to ask you to reconsider middle school start times? Because teaching our kids to listen to their bodies is a lesson that too many adults don't learn. By requiring middle school students to get on buses as early as 6.45 a.m., you're starting the habit of ignoring one's bodily needs early. And ignoring our body's needs takes a physical and a mental toll. I also ask this because it is very rare for any leadership body to be able to make one change. It may not be simple, it may not be easy, but one change that has such a profound impact on so many people and so many families. When we have gotten enough rest, and I speak as a parent of someone who just graduated from the middle school system, we are less stressed, we make better decisions, and we are more able to be kind to each other, to say nothing of the research about better test grades. Please study how to change school start times along with the many other worthy things on your plates so that no one has to start class before 8 a.m. Thank you. Michelle Cates. Good evening, I'm speaking to you as an individual tonight. I wasn't planning on speaking, but felt motivated to do so. I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Reed, to Principal Amy Goodlow for supporting our Jewish students and all in our community who are impacted by the war in Israel and Gaza. Two of my children have friends whose friends were murdered or kidnapped this week. One of them was mentioned by name on the radio when I was on my way here. Five members of a family of a Woodson High School graduate are also being held hostage. This is happening here to our community. So thank you, Dr. Reed, for your work with JCRC, with the Jewish Community Relations Council, and thank you to Dr. Goodlow for her response to an anti-Semitic bias crime that occurred in the parking lot at Chantilly High School this week 
on Tuesday and has not received much, if any, press coverage. Now all three of my children have encountered anti-Semitism in FCPS. Dr. Goodlow took action that is a model for how FCPS can respond to horrific situations by sharing with parents, staff, and students about terrible things that we wish could be brushed aside. By setting a tone of firm condemnation of this act and the expectation of a caring, supportive environment in our school, by transparently sharing action steps that the administration and team are taking in response, and by consulting with JCRC, which modeled to our students, to our staff, and to our community a willingness to learn and to ask for help. Knowledge builds support, understanding, empathy, compassion, unity, and action toward building an even stronger community. Thank you very much. Mora Yazin. Thank you. I will start to introduce myself. I am a product of Fairfax County Public Schools, and my son recently graduated as well. So I, I think I know a little bit about Fairfax County Public Schools. And what I'm hearing today is very biased. And it's also a reflection of what's in our, our society and our, our media. It's all about what's happening to Israel, which is a political term, okay? In my family, it's called Palestine, okay? Let me tell you about my heritage. I'm Irish American. I grew up during the Troubles, okay? And we're still fighting British occupation. My husband is Palestinian and also has Syrian blood, okay? They are fighting American occupation, okay, as well as American-assisted occupation of Israel. That's the reality that we look at, okay? And when we see that the mainstream media doesn't report the facts that we know, okay? It reminds me a lot of my childhood growing up Irish American, okay? When our family was called terrorists for supporting the IRA, the freedom fighters of the day, okay? Hamas are freedom fighters. Hezbollah are freedom fighters. They are fighting, they are the indigenous people of that land. And they are fighting the settler colonials, the brutal settler colonial occupation of Palestine. Okay, those are the facts from an indigenous person. I have Native American and I have Irish American heritage. Okay, think about that. Think about looking through these eyes at the world's affairs right now. I am so ashamed of what's going on in this, this country. So ashamed. Please play the video submitted by William Didana. Hi, I'm William Didana. I'm a senior at Madison High School, and today I'm going to be addressing the school board on a critical issue I believe has been plaguing many students, especially at Madison, and I have heard throughout the entirety of Fairfax County Public Schools for the last couple of months. That issue is the issue of Chromebooks, which have been the common replacement for the old laptops that have been substituted out that were originally from Windows, but now are being used and replaced by another form of laptop in the Chromebooks. Now, these Chromebooks are, how would you say, unsatisfactory at best and at worst outright harmful to work productivity and also general safety of the community. In this, I mean that not only are the Chromebooks incredibly slow, fr frustrating to use for students, have several key features missing, such as the right click, and cannot do basic tasks that Windows computers can, but also they generate a humongous amount of e-waste in the fact that they have a very, very short lifespan as per technology goes. Now, 
the FTPS school board can very easily address this problem by stopping Chromebook initiatives at other schools instead of continuing on the path down that they're going on and use the old Windows laptops as substitutes as a stopgap until a better solution is found. I do understand that the Windows laptops are getting quite slow. However, they are not quite as problematic to many students as the Chromebooks are. And I believe that the Chromebooks are a problem that needs to be solved quickly or else they will be ending up in a cycle where Chromebooks will have to be constantly replaced and cycled in and out. That is it. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, that is our last public speaker. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Item, agenda item 4.02, Academic Matters. Dr. Reed, will you now share Academic Matters? Thank you, Mr. Frisch. And it's really exciting this evening to be able to share the newly released SAT scores uh, for our uh, Virginia Commonwealth, for Fairfax County, and our nation. We're thrilled to have an opportunity uh, to share these this evening. So here we go. And so I want to remind our board and our community that Fairfax County Public Schools has outperformed SAT global and state total mean scores every year since the new tests were implemented, beginning with the class of 2018. Additionally, and we're feeling um, additionally at this point for 2023, there is very little change. It's single digit uh, change from the class of 2022, signaling a stop to the slightly downward trend we've had in the last several years resulting from the pandemic. In contrast, both the state and global outcomes continue to drop more precipitously in double-digit drops. So we're feeling like we're stabilizing and will continue to build up from here forward. One of the things that we feel especially proud of is the number of students or the participation rate percentage of our students here in Fairfax County. One of the things that's very important to us and as outlined in our new strategic plan is excellence, equity, and opportunity. And this board with its vision several years ago made sure that every student had the opportunity to participate in the SAT and the PSAT and compete um, for national merit opportunities as well as gain post-secondary access as a result of having uh, the tests be accessible during the school day. And so as you look at the participation rates from class of 2018 through 2023, we continue to maintain a high rate of participation, even though <clears throat> the Commonwealth's participation has precipitously dropped over the last several years. I want to share that the overview of our PSAT and SAT school testing this year, um, we want to share that there have been some glitches. Uh, with the first year of digital PSAT testing and we our staff worked very hard this was not the uh, Fairfax County issue but rather College Board uh, had on their website they were experiencing some national issues in terms of offering this as a digital exam for the first time uh, the PSAT administration was the first digital PSAT and the College Board is planning to move forward with SAT in the spring of 2024 being online. Um, we also sent a letter to the College Board and National Merit, uh, Dr. Presidio, our Chief Academic Officer, uh, outlining really our grave concerns and about opportunities for students given the delay and start time for some of the digital exams and we are going to be working with them to really try to bring those systems up to speed as we assess students across the county in this new digital manner. But we wanted to make sure that we registered, registered our concerns on the day of the exam because we know how important this is for our students and families. And lastly, just want to remind our community there are resources for families if they want to prepare for SAT exams or in the event that there was a 
uh, problem or conflict with their online digital PSAT, and they will be hearing more from their schools about that. But there are free materials online, tutor.com, Khan Academy, and collegeboardbluebook.app, which actually includes full-length practice exams. So a lot of opportunity, as well as College Board res uh, resources with SAT School Day and PSAT. So we, are, um, no we know that scores, individual student scores, will be shared by College Board later this semester, and these resources continue to be available throughout the year. So that is Academic Matters this evening. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Ms. Pekarski. Hello. Oh, thank you, Dr. Reed, for this. I was just wondering um, how widely impacted were we um, with the glitches? Were students um, able to complete the tests or, or not? And so well, thank you, Ms. Pekarski. I, the students who got to start the exam were able to complete it. What we had were some significant delays in the start at some sites. Dr. Presidio, I know you <coughs> And Ms. Klemenko and the team were monitoring this, Ms. Glazer. So um, if you have uh, a comment, I would appreciate it. No, absolutely. And thank you for that question. And, and first of all, we want to apologize to the students and the families and also the teachers who were proctoring the test um, about those glitches. And as Dr. Reed mentioned, uh, those were not on our end. They were on the college board's end. Um, but nevertheless, uh, many of our students did experience test disruption. So we're in the process of collecting all of the numbers right now of students that were either unable to test or were unable to test successfully. Um, so earlier today, uh, principals started to submit their numbers to us, as well as reaching out again to families and students via email uh, to let them know that if they experienced test disruptions and had concerns, that they need to report that so that we can have an accurate number. So it's probably gonna take us a few days to have the total number. Um, what I will report, which is good news, uh, is the severity seems to be less significant than we feared yesterday. Um, many of the schools were able through, you know, diligence of the teachers um, to actually be able to complete the testing for the students. So um, it's not as big of a disruption as we feared and we're in the process of getting the final numbers and we'll work with those individuals that were impacted um, on a makeup test. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Um, just going back to the second slide where you showed the performance of over the five years from Fairfax County. I just really wanna spend a little bit of time here because I know there's a narrative in our community that our student performance on the SAT has been in, in heavy decline. And by looking at the numbers here, we are outperforming out um, the, the, the Commonwealth um, because our students are at the average is 1181 this past year, 1185 the year before. Um, the highest we've had was in 2019 at 1218, but it definitely is creeping back up to that amount. So I really wanted to make sure that our community heard that we are still as strong as ever right. in performance in this area. Um, I would, however, like to speak a little bit in terms of the participation. Um, I've noticed the participation rate for FCPS was highest in 2018 and it is just on the decline generally, bouncing up a little bit more from 2021. Um, just like to get your thoughts on to why you think this is. Is it, does the fact that many colleges are no longer requiring the SAT a factor? Or how do you believe that that has impacted our students' uh, participation in this assessment? Well, I think that, um the availability of the assessment, it looks like 2021 was when we first returned, right, to school, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that spring. So I know a number of students perhaps didn't advantage themselves of that opportunity. By 2022, our numbers are popping back up. Um, and again, our participation is slightly down as a percentage. Um, I don't know, Dr. Presidio, do you have thoughts on that? I, to me, it feels like it, there are more universities and colleges that are test optional, certainly, um, so that is plausible. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Anderson and, and Dr. Reed, you, you've covered it really, and this is something that we've looked at and considered for a while, and um, we do believe that the biggest, two, the two biggest impacts in that slight downward trend are COVID and then the fact that many colleges and universities are advertising that they're test optional. Now, we continue to offer the SAT available 
um, during school day testing for free for our students because we also know that you know, when you have high scores on the SAT, that makes you more selective. It gives you additional opportunities uh, for scholarships. So we still see value in the students taking the test. Whether or not they actually submit the scores, obviously, is an individual decision for uh, the student and the family to make. Yeah, I need, thank you, Dr. Presidio. And I also want to just share <clears throat> the correlation that while our particip participation has stayed very high compared to the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. performance is actually staying high as well. Mm -hmm. And we're testing all students. So I really think there's something to be said for all students and staying high and the Commonwealth having many fewer students and actually mm -hmm. not as high. No, thank you so much for um, pointing that out. A another issue that I wanna raise with you, because I know you've been the recipient of maybe some of those inquiries, but I know I've received a number from some of our high school teachers who are still asking, why is it that we're taking a full day to do this? Because we have some students who participate and the others are at home, particularly our ninth graders. Uh, I would love to hear thoughts to maybe revisiting that as per some of the very cogent arguments right. that were made by those teachers who've emailed, I think, both of us. So I can share a brief story and then I'll ask Dr. Presidio to comment as well because I know he was likely part of that original decision. I can say that in a prior life and another opportunity, um, we had a young student who was actually a senior in their SAT fall uh, senior exam get a perfect SAT score and had never taken the PSAT. But because that next year we did in school um, testing, that particular student hadn't had transportation availability the year before to take the PSAT on the weekend and also missed out on the national merit competition opportunity because they weren't able to take the PSAT. And had we not had the SAT in a school day, wouldn't have demonstrated a perfect SAT score, which then garnered scholarship money sufficient to enable them to attend university mm -hmm. at no cost, actually. So I think we see it as an excellent access opportunity and equitable um, access for our students. Dr. Presidio, do you want to share other thoughts maybe unique to Fairfax? Just real briefly, because again, I think you, you covered it. I mean, again, we've been approaching this really as an equity of access and opportunity um, issue for our students. And being able to provide that school day testing, we think is incredibly important. Um, and you know, we did not reach that decision lightly. Uh, because anytime you end up with a disrupted schedule or a different schedule uh, in the school day, uh, we, you know, we understand how that um, can be frustrating for, you know, students, families, and teachers. But the vast majority of the feedback that we've received from the community and our teachers is that they fully understand what we're doing and understand why it's important to do it. Um, and we certainly appreciate their patience and diligence in, in helping us to make this successful for our students. Thank you. And uh, my final question uh, that I shared with you very briefly earlier that I do want to go ahead and raise here is the teachers are required by College Board to sign a contract um, to administer this assessment, which states that they should not disparage um, the exam in any way. So if teachers feel as if the exam is inequitable, they're not allowed to say that. I, I'm very curious in terms of one, I know you were not aware of it, but I want to raise it for awareness here. And two, to really question how can they hold our teachers accountable to a separate contract for the administration of this assessment? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Dr. Anderson. And we are looking into that because mm -hmm. that seems like a remarkably unreasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. So I know Mr. Foster is working on that with Dr. Presidio's team. Uh, I don't know if you have any kind of an update, Dr. Presidio, but we should have one shortly on that topic. We, we don't have an update just yet, but I would say just as a point of clarification that that particular language is only with respect to if an individual is using the College Board trademark. So it's only if they're purporting to represent the, the, the College Board in some way. It's not personal comments that they would make if they're purposely um, misrepresenting or um, using that trademark trademark in an inappropriate way. But nevertheless, that is something that we've raised with the College Board and Mr. Yeah. Foster and I are taking a look at that. I but definitely might be able to be done. Thank you. I definitely think that needs a little bit more um, investigation because um, the teachers in question who were, I think, surprised by that language had decided to not sign said contract so they could not proctor the assessment just this past week. Um, I, I think we owe our teachers an explanation on this one and to ensure that they're not um, unwillingly 
signing off some rights that they may have. So I would appreciate the follow-up as soon as you're able. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Amesh. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to follow that um, in thinking about access and making sure all our kids are able to benefit from the wonderful resources we have um, in preparing them for the next step. I wanted to ask about that tutor.com piece. I know I brought this up at a previous Academic mm -hmm. Matters. Um, in just our, our obser observation of trends and access, I don't know how much we track or what we track, but um, just to maximize that resource. And I know, I think last time we spoke a little bit about thinking a little bit creatively mm -hmm. uh, in how we market it and how we make sure all the student, all students are aware it's available because I think we were seeing right. at some point a shortage in use or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if we have updates on that or any information. I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head, but I definitely can collect that information and send it out and share it with the board. And for the public that might be listening, the tutor.com uh, resource is exceptional in terms of the support. It's free, it's available, um, you know, seven days a week, and we really do want our students to understand that it's available. They can get help in multiple languages. Um, so it's a huge resource for them academically. And of course, here we're highlighting that they can even get SAT and ACT uh, prep there. So we'll continue to promote it, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, I mean, you know, for the public, it took a lot to get here. It took a lot to be able to get this contract and, and provide free tutoring for every kid uh, in pretty much every subject that they would need it for. And it's just available through their SIS. So please take advantage of that. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Presidio, if you don't have the exact numbers, if, if you've observed trends or anything, or if anything's changed, improved. And it's okay if that's not available either, but. Yeah, I'll have to get the numbers. I don't want to misrepresent them. Thank you, though. Yeah. Um, Dr. Reed, I just want to make sure we're taking a look at that to just maximize. I, I cannot imagine how useful this is to families. And no doubt the face-to-face -face is ideal, but you know, to prevent slipping and b bridge those academic gaps and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, a point at which we'll come and say it's being used to its full right. you know, benefit. So anyway, appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. I'm going to take a turn really quickly, very quickly. Um, some time ago, we, you and I spoke about um, testing readiness and developing test-taking skills and strategies in our students. Um, one way is presented in this uh, proposal or in this uh, presentation, tutor.com, Khan Academy, College Board, Blue Book app. Um, that is very self-motivated, right? Like somebody has to, to seek it out. Um, and we've removed barriers to access for the SAT, right. which is why our participation is so high. Correct. What can we do, and perhaps it's around the marketing of these materials, to Ms. Amesha's point about tutor.com, perhaps it's around, at least initially, the marketing of these resources to students and their families. Sometimes it does take a nudge from a parent to get them to buckle down and get ready for the mm -hmm. test. What more can we be doing to make these resources available and widely known that they're available? <laughs> I didn't understand that answer. I think the clerk has got that under control. Sorry okay. about that, Dr. Reed. No, that's fine. I, you know, I think we we're exploring the possibility of also having um, a more robust landing page for tutoring resources and assessments in general. So I think. Um, and as we work to develop an app, a division-wide app, we're going to be able to push information out because so many of our students and families actually utilize their information gathering from mobile devices, really. They're not sitting down as often, you know, at a desktop uh, computer. So I think there are a variety of ways we can market that. I think our staff in the schools um, have been excited about that. Um, and we're open to any ideas the public has as well. So please email us if you have ideas. Uh, but we do know that students who take time to prepare uh, for these exams actually do improve their performance. There are certain strategies uh, that do enable and support increased achievement. Uh, and there, again, we can at times see a gap in terms of students who are able to access a Kaplan program or something that's more uh, robust in test prep. Thank you, Dr. Reed. We have no more lights, so we will relieve you for a moment. Thank you. Um, Agenda item 4.03, student representative matters. I call on Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. As many of you are aware, the upcoming vote on the Whitson name change is on the agenda for this evening. 
As a fellow student from Woodson, I want to express my gratitude for the chance to connect with student representatives from clubs, sport teams, and other organizations to discuss the name change. While W.T. Woodson may have made many contributions, it's essential to acknowledge that his influence didn't reach everyone. Woodson's historical support for segregation is recognized among students in at, and it has led to a strong desire for a name change. During the segregation era, African Americans faced immense challenges and injustices. In 2023, it is our duty to distance ourselves from any remnants of a segregationist mindset and uphold the principle that all individuals are equal. Following numerous student meetings, it is clear that most students support the name change, viewing it as a crucial step towards fostering a more inclusive environment. By aligning with goal number two in our strategic plan, which envisions every student will experience an equitable school, and school community where student health and well-being are prioritized and student voice is centered, our decision to proceed with the name change will serve as a testament to our dedication to achieving goal number two. Woodson's mission statement is to empower our community to reach their individual potential by creating a healthy environment of mutual respect, responsibility, equity, and inclusion. Moving towards the name change will help us create that healthy environment of inclusion and demonstrate our ongoing commitment to building a welcoming community. The renaming of W.T. Woodson represents a significant step towards justice and unity. It serves as a reminder that our present should not be constrained or defined by the past. A new school name would embody the strength of our community, our compassion, and a belief in our commitment to providing for each student irrespective of their background. It acts as a celebration of diversity and a pledge to honor the numerous voices that history silenced unjustly. Through the renaming, we began on a journey towards a brighter, more inclusive environment where the lessons of history bring us towards a more compassionate and understanding future. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude for the dedication and effort put into this matter by the school board, FCPS leadership, and our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item 4.04, .04, superintendent matters. I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. So just uh, several items since last we met. I have had an opportunity to hold three more community conversations at Glasgow Middle School, Whitman Middle School, and Kilmer Middle School. And it's great to have a chance to hear uh, from families and community members and staff at those events. We do have two more community conversations scheduled during the week of October 23rd, um, one at Madison High School on the 24th and Liberty Middle School on the 25th. Also had our first of two employee conversations uh, last week at Stone Middle School, and this week uh, we, had, we were at Twain Middle School. It was great to hear from staff, um, their concerns and excitement for the year, um, and suggestions for us in improving and taking our game up. The next staff uh, conversations will occur Monday the 16th at Hughes Middle School and Thursday the 19th at Langley High School. I encourage all students, uh, teachers and staff, and all educators in whatever role in the division to come out and join us and share your experience, ideas, and thoughts. I want to mention that this week we were able to host U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack at Annandale Terrace High School. And it was a fabulous way to recognize National School Lunch Week and National Farm to School Month. Uh, it was a great visit and we really appreciate um, the opportunity to connect um, with the staff at Annandale Terrace Elementary School. This morning uh, we celebrated at Annandale High School the uh, fact that we have all 198 of our schools with salad bars this year. And I think we have one program yet we have to go. Uh, but we know how important uh, good food is to mental health as well as the academic achievement of our young students. Middle school cross country as well has been very exciting. Last Saturday, uh, or a week ago Saturday, we were able to join in the excitement at several schools, and I know a number of board members also attended. We now have just over 2,000 middle schoolers running all over the county, and um, which is fabulous, actually. Um, Want to especially thank Executive Director uh, Bill Curran and his staff, including Tom Horn and Christopher Friend, and all of the middle school principals, the staff, um, the coaches, everyone that's come out, and the families that are cheering us on. It's just really fabulous to see that excitement. Yesterday I had a chance also with 30 of our Mark Twain Middle School Tiger young uh, girls, and we had a chance to 
Uh, the girls participating in cross country and some of our STEM club, uh, girls from Twain Middle School, we were able to um, attend an event at the White House where First Lady Jill Biden honored 15 young women around the country who are leading change in their local communities. It was a great experience for our young Tigers and they were really beaming and had a lot of excitement about community service as we left. Last week, I also had an opportunity to attend a digital equity summit um, hosted by Doc Cox Communications that had um, our county executive, Brian Hill, and several other members of our community talking about how important the equitable access to technology is, which is part of goal five here on our strategic plan, and also the opportunity to utilize the new federal dollars that the Commonwealth of Virginia has received. Lake Braddock Secondary School, I think was mentioned earlier by Ms. McLaughlin, it was great to celebrate the 50th anniversary um, as it opened in 1973. And finally, just again, a big shout out to all of our principals and assistant principals as October is National Principal Month. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, agenda item 4.05, presentation on choosing to move forward with the W.T. Woodson High School renaming. I once again call on Dr. Reed. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to take a five minute recess.
If board members could return to the dais. Board members could return to the dais, please. I hear the... All right, we'll try this again. Uh, agenda item 4.05, presentation on choosing to move forward with the W.T. Woodson High School renaming. I once again call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. This evening, I'd like to review for our community the process and the feedback we have received to date. I wanna remind our community that uh, per policy 8170, if we could go ahead and go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the school board may consider a change in the name of an existing school or facility to ensure an inclusive, respectful learning environment as outlined in our adopted One Fairfax policy or when the board deems it appropriate. I want to remind the uh, community also of our process and timeline. And this is phase one, essentially, and you can walk through the dates. I want to remind um, our team that uh, the process began in September with the request to consider a name change being presented to the school board. It was then posted as new business and feedback was begun in terms of being collected from the community about whether or not to rename W.T. Woodson High School using an online feedback form. Holding a, co a community meeting at Woodson earlier this month and then a public hearing on Tuesday of this week. That brings us to this evening with the school board vote and then my recommendation to the board in the second round of community engagement. During the phase one of this community engagement, you can see four, 1,415 responses were received through the online feedback form. At the Woodson community meeting, there were approximately 60 people who attended and then we had eight speakers at Tuesday's public hearing. I wanna share um, an overview of the online feedback, and I don't think I need to read it um, to each of you, but this illustrates the different roles of those who did provide feedback. Again, reminding our community that we had 1,415 unique responses to this feedback form. So, in looking at the support for renaming of all responses, the, to the question of how likely are you to support renaming W.T. Woodson High School, 779 respondents said they were not likely to, re, uh, to support this, while 587 respondents said they were very or somewhat likely to support the renaming process. When we look at this uh, feedback by role, uh, we have other alumni, parent, or caregiver for grand totals, but essentially this is a breakdown of the primary group, groups who responded and their level of support for this process. All of this is posted on board docs if you wanna take a closer look this evening. So for our preliminary feedback on the name suggestions, 454 uh, respondents suggested support for the Carter G. Woodson name 
And as you may recall, this was part of the forum topic and the co-sponsored initiated, who initiated the name change process following the advocacy of current students and community members were considering renaming the school in honor of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a nationally renowned scholar, author, educator, and journalist. He is universally considered the father of black history. And as we look at the preliminary data, um, as again, 454 respondents uh, supported the Carter G. Woodson name, 42 respondents supported simply removing the WT and leaving it Woodson, 163 had no suggestion, 109 suggested no change, and there were 369 discrete all other name suggestions. As I had the opportunity to evaluate all of the um, feedback that we've received to date, the following would constitute my recommendation. I think at this point I would suggest, and uh, my recommendation is uh, to consider the following. Woodson High School, remove the WT, or Carter G. Woodson High School, and continue to seek input from the community during the second phase of public education. Public engagement. So the process and timeline for phase two, again, um, between October 13th, which is tomorrow, and November 1, we'll have again an online feedback form open. There'll be another community hearing at Woodson High School a public hearing here on October 24th, and then the board will take final action to rename the facility on November 9th. To stay informed and stay engaged, please visit the Woodson renaming webpage for updates, engagement opportunities, sign up for a mailing list, and a feedback form. So again, just to reiterate, my as superintendent, I'm recommending the uh, name Woodson High School, removing the WT, or Carter G. Woodson High School, and that the board continue to seek input during phase two of public engagement. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Dr. Reed. All right, I am gonna be making the motion, so I'll be turning over the gavel to Ms. Pekarski. Agenda item 5.01, performance review, executive expectation number. What's wrong? Is there an issue? Oh, that is not on this agenda. Are we taking a poll? Yeah, it's under action. It's under action item. Yeah. Okay, agenda item 5.01, performance review executive expectation number one, global executive expectations. The next order of business is a performance review for executive expectation number one, global executive expectations. As we noted at our September 28th regular meeting each year, the superintendent will provide a monitoring report for each of the 13 executive expectations detailed in the strategic governance manual. The board may discuss the superintendent's performance with regard to the executive expectation and we will vote to determine if the superintendent is in compliance with it. If the board finds that the superintendent is not in compliance with the executive expectation, the superintendent will provide the board with a corrective action plan at the next regular meeting. Please note that the board will also take a small recess while each school board member fills out a monitoring report with respect to the executive expectation. I'll now call on Dr. Reed for the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. So executive expectation number one is really the bedrock of what all the expectations. It's uh, characterized as the global executive expectation and it really, um, essentially indicates that uh, the superintendent shall not cause, allow, or fail to take reasonable measures to prevent any practice, activity, decision, or organizational condition that is unlawful, unethical, unsafe, disrespectful, imprudent, in violation of school board policy, endangers the division's public image or credibility, or leaves the division unprepared for emergency situations or as a conflict of interest. 
and also to that the superintendent shall maintain a data-informed system focused on continuous improvement to implement and monitor efforts toward achieving the goals defined in the division's strategic plan and the priorities of the board's educational equity policy. So this evening, um, I'm certifying that the information contained in this report is true as of October 12th. And to the best of my knowledge, I believe I am in compliance with the board's ex, um, expectation around global constraint. The indicators I've listed below, and you have those um, in front of you, essentially the indicators include reasonable measures uh, to prevent any practice, activity, decision, or organizational condition that's unlawful, unethical, unsafe, disrespectful, imprudent, or in violation of school board policy which lists a number of um, HR background checks and professional development opportunities, and the division's public image or credibility. Uh, again, talks a little bit about our communications plan and the work we've done staying in connection with our internal audience and external audience, as well as major incident response trainings, active monitoring, and so forth. Our emergency situations and preparedness uh, we've updated our emergency manuals. We've completed our annual VDOE DC JS safety audit. Um, all schools maintain a uniform crisis plan and classroom crisis management plans. And um, under conflict of interest, we've ensured the implementation of policy 4430 and regulation 4430 to comply with the uniform standards of conduct contained in the Virginia State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of the data informed systems focused on continuous improvement, we are creating a number of data dashboards, several of which you saw last spring and more on the way. Uh, we've also begun the baseline development of accountability metrics and leading indicators, which will provide an opportunity to monitor progress towards our strategic plan measures. The school improvement plans have been aligned as well as we are also developing department and uh, improvement plans for our pillar work. Initiated the development um, of these department plans uh, as they did not previously exist and initiated the development of an annual research and program evaluation agenda that's aligned with strategic plan priorities. Um, also want to mention that there is a data form system that's focused on continuous improvement toward achieving the priorities of the board's educational equity policy. Uh, we did pass that in June 26 of 2023. So that work around benchmarking data is occurring right now. So I think in terms of EE1 at this time, it's a year um, where it's been several months of building the structures and systems for which we'll be able to, in future expectations, share our measurements as well as our goal uh, presentations. So. That's the EE1 presentation, Mr. Frisch and Ms. Pekarski. Thank you, Dr. Reed. At this time, I'll invite board members to ask any questions or provide comments. I see we're starting with Ms. Marin. Hi, thank you, Dr. Reed. So this is the, the first real go-round, right? It appears so. Okay, so um, in that vein, so my question is you just provided a lot of oral examples. Is there a place where those things will be written and linked both for the public and obviously for the board? I think in future executive um, expectations they will be, but we certainly can hyperlink them. I believe the regulations are hyperlinked. Um, so those are, they are online right now and those are available. So, so I guess, you know, what you're giving us is your word. Right. And I just think that we owe it to the community to leave that right. record of right. the evidence. Yeah. So that's where I'm just a little unclear. Okay. So it's not just the regulation, but like you said, we have these reports now that we've never had. So how do we get to that? So we can certainly link to those items um, or provide those as attachments moving forward. Because I'm certainly thinking about when we get really into the operations of the school division, right. especially when we have instructional uh, reports, I do think, and knowing us, right. we're going to want to know where is all that proof. Right. So um, yeah, okay, well, I look forward to seeing how that can evolve. Yeah, I think EE1 is so global that um, there tends to not be quite as much like, uh, uh, how do I say, data-centric examples, but many of the others are going to have very specific data points 
Um, but to your point, we can add more to this, I think, um, for sure. And is it correct then, so in the future when we go through all the EEs, the, that kind of data and information will be uploaded at least a, a week in advance? Correct. Actually, our hope is 10 days in advance okay. for the board and then posted with the board materials for the public. Right. So when you're presenting it to us, we will have already seen it, then correct. we're going to hear it and then ask other questions and then go and do this, although I know the board's going to take another right. look at that form. Sure. So that's the flow. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Saying it and reinforcing it. Okay. Right. No, our commitment is to get it to you 10 days in advance and then it's posted publicly Friday when we post board meetings. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Reed, for providing this um, brief overview of the um, executive expectation. Uh, your global executive expectation. I actually uh, mentioned this the other night, the other day, and I mention it again today because um, this really is a capstone expectation. Right. This is not an expectation that is one and done, and it's not an expectation that, frankly, providing an update to us mm -hmm. in the beginning of the fiscal calendar mm -hmm. um, when we actually will give an evaluation on this at the end of right. the year, um, it seems out of context. And so I would actually suggest that this is a nice update, but that uh, this global expectation uh, in the future not be presented at the beginning of the year, but at the end of the year. Because it, when you look at what the metrics are for this expectation, it's premature for anybody to think that they can give a full evaluation or even uh, provide feedback on something that is uh, such a short time frame. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. And I think in part, uh, a number of these systems, they'll be in place by next year. So we'll have a look back, a year long look back, but they're not currently in place. So um, I think to your point, Timing is everything. So based on that, um, may I make a suggestion and a motion tonight that we have uh, you come back to the board mm -hmm. at the end of uh, the fiscal year, perhaps in June, um, with an update on your global expectation one, because it really is your capstone and not something that sets, it, I mean, it sets the tone. It's almost like, uh, the beginning and the end, but it's it's really something that has to be evaluated as part of a total body of work. Okay, a motion has been made. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion's been made, seconded. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, you want to speak to this? Well, I think I have spoken to it. I, I don't believe that it's, you know, I think it's just something that would uh, provide for a full fuller conversation given the importance of this uh, topic. Okay, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, just very briefly, <clears throat> just speaking of timing, I, I think especially in this position that we are where we will have a board changeover, it will be hard to bring that information along in a very, um, in a robust way. So if we had the information at the end of the year, it would allow the, who, whatever is the board that is um, with us to see the continuity and to see the growth throughout the year. But I think Ms. Um, Corbett Sanders really captured it very well. Um, are there any others who would like to speak to this? Ms. Omesh? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess I, uh, I, I can understand the point people are making. I, on a similar but different vein, um, I know there was some angst around like committing to a position in terms of deciding whether there's compliance or not. I've certainly been talked to at nauseum about the concerns, and I, I mean, I came to see that, you know, I mean, our our, our board does have a tendency to kind of disrespect di different working styles and dismiss minority opinions on the board. So I want to find a way where we can all feel like this is something workable, this is a good idea, and that we create some space for those minority perspectives that might feel our current process has some issues. So, I, in my thinking and, and conversations this morning with Ms. Tolan, 
Um, a potential way forward is to decide, and colleagues can shoot this down, you know, it's, it's a potential solution, that we make this form optional and we, d we choose not to move forward with a vote, understanding that this is a public record, this is something that, I mean, it's ultimately going to governance, and governance is going to decide how we move forward, but in the interim, mm -hmm. that this serve as a public record, we provide our feedback to you, it gives you something to work with and be responsive to, we're going to indicate, obviously, where we think you are, in compliance, not in compliance, whatever, um, and then at the end of the year, with the new board, you know, you, you're, you're able to have more robust conversations where all this evidence has been prepared, and there's commentary available. Right. But board members can also choose to opt out of that. That's really on them. I would prefer to make sure my, you know, perspectives are articulated so you're able to respond. But some people are just uncomfortable also documenting that, and that's fine. But that's their choice of how they choose to represent and be a board member. So um, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to, in explaining that to my colleagues, I, I really think this is a little bit of room here to be respectful of how people want to do this differently and the working styles while still accomplishing the goal of having Dr. Reed speak to us, of having her have a basis for this accountability where she feels it's actually quantitative and there's actually you know, material that we're evaluating her on, um, but perhaps not cornering folks who feel this will corner them, as we saw in the work session. I mean, we were a pretty divided house that day. So I, I would like to move that we decide to move forward, having this be an optional form as a matter of our process and that we not take a vote, but that board members can indicate their position on their form, if they so choose. Okay, Ms. Omesh, uh, I, I'd like to ask the parliamentarian, is this motion germane to the main motion? Whether it's germane, it sounds like it's a new main motion. Yeah. And you can't have another main motion okay. while a main motion is pending. Okay, I just wanted to make sure something was off. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Omesh, if we could just hold on to that for a minute. Um, we're gonna speak to this motion that Ms. Car uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders has put forward and seconded um, by Dr. Anderson. I do not see anyone else who would like to speak to it. So I think we're gonna go ahead and take the vote. Um, and the this is, um, for the motion for Dr. Reed to come back at the end of the school year to provide an update on executive expectation number one, global expectations. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed? Okay, that motion passes with uh, I, I didn't get to vote. Why, no I don't. I, I'm, Stop. I'm sorry, I don't have a way to show that I'm raising my hand. That's okay, Ms. Keys Gamara. Are you voting in the affirmative? Yes, I am. Okay, that motion passes with everyone at the table here today, except for Ms. Tolan and Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Um, okay, now I will call on Ms. Omesh for the new motion. Okay, I move to revise our process to have our forms be optional per, uh, per board member while being public record for those who submit it, and eliminating the mandatory vote on each component. Um, yeah, that's it. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Okay, Ms. Omesh, you wanna to speak to this anymore? As I said, I, I really was trying to be intentional in, in realizing that we were, we could have been really six to six, seven to five, whatever, at the work session in determining how we wanna move forward. I think Dr. Reed needs clarity from us. She needs, you know, year-long conversations around the accountability piece so that we're ensuring that, that we're not being arbitrary at the end of the year and that we're being fair to her to give her the opportunity to put things forward. As a board, we have a duty to the community to hold her accountable, obviously, um, and to base that off of real information and facts, but also to be able to do that in a way that we answer to the community about how we do it as individual board members, um, and so in the spirit, this really came out of wanting to just be respectful of different working styles, to, give, to lend some credence to those who spoke very passionately. I mean, we have some people who feel extremely strongly uh, that the way we're moving forward isn't ideal. And so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with coming to a middle ground, giving some sense of respect to the idea that maybe for those of us who didn't feel as strongly, there's something we're missing. Uh, and so to attempt to bring us together and uh, develop a process that factors in the various considerations that were raised at the work session, I think this can move us forward while still accomplishing 
all the goals we've been intending to achieve with the previously articulated process. Dr. Anderson, speak to your second. No, I think Ms. Somes has captured it, and we talked about this fairly lengthily on Tuesday. We did. Ms. Smear? What has interested me in this model from the outset is that it is a renowned board leadership program. I urge my colleagues to join me in my humility in adopting a system as it is presented to us whole to see how it works before we start picking it apart and making our own changes. I'm perfectly happy to revisit it, but I do think we need to give this a shot. This is what Dr. Reed has recommended. It's what has been tried and true. I really am, gr it's difficult to do this kind of last minute changing at the board table. I hope that we can, I don't support this motion. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, I do not see any other lights. Are there, oh, I can tell. Opportunity. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I take that back. Mr. Frisch would like to speak to this. Okay, yeah, Ms. Keys Gamara, why don't you go ahead? Sorry, we can't hear you very well, so please speak up. Is this better? Yep, that's better. Okay. So, um, I am very concerned, and I will state my continuing ob objection to this proposal. The essence of my concern, I'm hearing an echo, so it's, I, I'm stopping. I'm, I'm no, sorry. Ms. Um, Ms. Keys Gamar, you're fine. Okay. Um, first, I need to state that there seems there continues to be statement that the board adopted the proposal is Mr. Carver, which is being referred to as the gold standard. The board did not adopt that, and the chair clarified that at our last meeting on Tuesday. I have significant concerns regarding the uh, how we have a structure of balance checks and balances for this board. I understand that different people believe that this may provide greater transparency. However, the proposal before us offers an opportunity for us to receive a report, which I am happy to receive, but it does not provide a full and meaningful opportunity for a discussion that it is to be included in the evaluation process, which is mandated that we discuss in July. The document that has been proposed is pass fail. What is required of us by the state has many more levels and much more in-depth conversation. We as a board have not discussed how those will be reconciled. For that reason, as well as my concern about the checks and balances that are central to how we govern in this nation, and it is reflective in every area that, whether it is federal, state, local, or on this school board, as a board member, it is our job to make sure that we are hearing the concerns of our constituents and that we are holding the superintendent accountable. That means those discussions that I just mentioned need to take place. And until we do, I cannot and will not support this process. And to be given a document that we have not discussed as to how it will fit into the whole of the process of the evaluation is inappropriate in my opinion and does not respect the balance of government that I have learned is important to our democracy. So. I, I will support this as an alternative, but in any case, I cannot participate in something that does not respect that balance of government and allows me to represent constituent concern. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Frisch. A couple things. One, 
many of the arguments about this, this uh, process have been centered around whether or not the superintendent's office prepares work for us. The school board would not function if the superintendent and the leadership team did not prepare work for us. What we do with that work is what is critical. Much of what we get for the superintendent's evaluation is prepared by the superintendent. And then what we do with that is what matters. At the work session, the board took a consensus vote to look at these things in more detail because we wanted it to be deliberative. This, we've, deci we've discussed over and over again that doing it like this is not deliberative. It's certainly not deliberative for our two colleagues who are not here tonight. If this is truly what five or six people of our board want to do tonight, I invite them to wait until the next meeting to make this motion when everybody can participate. That would be more deliberative. Everybody would be here to discuss it. This is a transparent process. It, it deliberately takes segments of the superintendent's responsibilities brings them before the public for consideration, asks the board to participate in the review of the superintendent's abilities and uh, accomplishments or lack thereof on many different pieces of their job in front of the cameras, in front of the public. I think that is refreshing. We didn't do that with previous superintendent when I was on the board. Maybe we've done it in the past before that. But I'll be voting against this. That doesn't mean I wouldn't support something like this down the road. But doing it here, right now, people can decide whether or not they want to take this action when the full board is not here for a more deliberative process. Fairness says we wait and continue what the board decided when all of us were there. I believe all of us were there at the work session, minus one. At the work session on Tuesday, who was missing? Everybody. When we voted to put this to governance committee, everybody was there. Don't, don't. Okay. So, I would encourage us to wait on this until everybody's back. Mr. Frisch, am I hearing you make a motion to postpone this vote until we have um, the whole board back together? I think it's postpone indefinitely. indefinitely. Well, no, postpone until a certain a time certain. Um, that's an okay motion without a date, Mr. Parliamentarian. Until the next <laughs> board meeting. That's yeah, it can't be to postpone to a certain time. Would You'd have to postpone it to at the most the next meeting. That okay. would be the motion. Um, is there a second to that? Seconded by Ms. Cohen. Um, do you want to speak to that? I think you have. I've just spoken to it. I'll <laughs> let Ms. Cohen speak to it. Ms. Cohen. No, I, th I think... Um, I mean, we just voted on this in the work session, so I don't, I'm not 100% sure why we're revisiting it. Um, I will say, I think in the way that our system is set up, that we have all 12 people on the board of her election. Um, every four years, we have eight people who are not returning. And so to me, I see this as a gift to be able to give folks who are gonna come after us some record of our interactions with you and our thoughts on the job you're doing. Um, and I think it is very unfair to you for us to walk away and not have given the people who will come after us some understanding of the kind of superintendent we have thought you were, why we were here, the kind of job that we think we're doing. So you're taking the time to prepare each of these pieces, um, each of these executive expectations, reporting on them at every meeting, and we are responding to it. I mean, this document is response. Is someone in compliance? Are they making adequate progress towards compliance or not in compliance? This is not, um, you know, the Ten Commandments. This is like our opinion of how you're doing something. So I, I, I remain um, clearly frustrated because to me, if we had walked in as eight new people last time and, and been given this opportunity, um, I think it would have been a lot easier and it would have been a lot fairer to the four people who were left who had to work tirelessly to try to get us to understand 
how to evaluate the superintendent when we'd been there six months, by the way, three of those during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm highly supportive of this process. I agree with Ms. Marin. For goodness sakes, could we give something a try? And then if it doesn't work, I'm so happy to revisit it, but let's at least give it a try. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. I need school board members to turn off your lights, please, and only turn them back on if you wanna to speak to this postponement motion. Okay, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, I, I do appreciate the sentiment of Mr. Frisch's request, but um, since we've come back in August um, at our board meetings, Tonight we have uh, two missing board members. We have 10 of us here because Ms. Corbett Sanders or Ms. Keith Gamara is participating. Um, I think that we've been missing at least one or two board members at each business meeting. So I, I don't feel that tonight is unusual um, in making a decision among the 10 of us. Um, you know, the other thing is that, um, you know, I'll speak to the other motion if this one fails. Um, but I'll just say this on why my rationale to not vote to postpone. Um, I think there are things such as piloting. It's something that I have been a champion of since I first joined this board that, um, and when you're trying something new and you haven't tested it out yet, in fairness to Dr. Reed and to the board and to the public, um, you do something that hasn't been tested and it, it could end up being worse. So I'm all for trying something new. Um, and I think that the prior motion that's being asked to po postpone, um, again, if this one fails and we get a chance to speak to the other motion on the table, um, I think there is some merit for piloting and um, looking at a way to say um, there can be a win-win here. Um, but uh, the mandatory piece, and I, I do think that at the work session there were a number of us, because we felt this was still too rushed, we agreed to send it to governance. So if that's the case, then I love the idea of the prior motion that's on the table. So I'm, I will not support postponing tonight. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Anderson, followed by Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, thank you. Um, I think very similarly to what Ms. Uh, McLaughlin said, I will not be supporting this motion because we've made a lot of decisions with less than the full complement of the board. Um, I remember the retreat work around the strategic plan, something that we considered to be most paramount to the progress of this division. And we did not always have 12 people there to make really substantive um, decisions. So it, it's unfortunate that we're here, but I don't think it's a I don't think we've had any precedent that we don't make major decisions or any decisions without the full complement of the board. So I, I'm not going to be supporting this motion. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarification. If we are to adopt this motion to postpone, are we then postponing any vote associated with this tonight? So we're postponing uh, Ms. Omesha's motion and we're postponing the subsequent vote on this um, this document or on this executive expectation no this is just for the question at hand which was Ms. Omesha's uh, motion as I understand it correct so I guess my other question is, as it is now, the um, forms are optional, or are they not? No. Okay, all right. Um, okay, it seems like they're optional. So, so the vote, the forms are optional, is what you're saying. So it's it's the because right now the motion says to revise our process so that the forms will be optional. 
I think this went a little bit further um, and it included the vote as well. Do I understand that correctly? Because I do not believe that what you said, Ms. Omesh, is actually captured in this motion. Can you, can you can, see? Can I actually ask for a clarification on what the vote was That's on Tuesday versus this vote? We can ask our clerk to please pull that up and let us know exactly what we voted on two days ago, which seems like a year ago. In the meantime, Ms. Somesh, please check the motion, and if it's not correct, please let me know so that we have everything documented properly. We also need Mr. Frisch's, we also need Mr. Frisch's uh, motion on the screen as well. I think it's fine, so, but we need to remove um, while the governance committee is considering the EE process. By default, whatever they bring will be adopted, so, but I don't want it to be contingent in the motion. Okay. What was voted on at the work session with regard to the form? Uh, there was two options. One was to remove the form from the process while the governance committee deals with it. The second option was to keep the form while the governance committee deals with it. Um, and it was that uh, with an understanding that the board members did not have to fill out the uh, form if they did not so wish. So the form would be passed out and then it would be collected by myself, but board members did not have to fill it out. In fact, at the last meeting, a board member did not fill out form, the form for EE number two. Okay, so it is optional. Okay, Ms. Corbett-Sanders, is that it? I was just trying to I know. get clarity on <laughs> Thank you. No, where I, we're I at. didn't mean that negatively. Point Thank of order, you. I just, can, can, if, if it could be restated, the sure. portion we voted on, that was Please the 7-5. Please go five. ahead, clerk. Can you reread the exact motion that was voted on on Tuesday? At some point, my recollection, the recollection is Mr. Frisch literally said, do we require the form or not? And we I vote. Don't, I, it was removing the form from the process while the governance committee deals with it was option one. And then the second option, because there was two votes, and the sec second option was keeping the form while the governance committee deals with it, but with the understanding that the form does not have to be filled out by all the school board members. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's keep going down the list. Oh, wait, Ms. Ms. Omesh, it was your turn next. Yeah, I mean... Obviously, this goes beyond that, so this is a different piece, but I guess I just want to ask my colleagues to first presume positive intent and second to actually listen to what I'm saying because w what I was presenting before is let's adopt this model. I think it's really exciting. I'm really proud of Dr. Reed for bringing this to us and helping us get ourselves together in a way that is effective in working with her. What I'm saying is let's meet those objectives while not imposing on colleagues things that they don't feel comfortable with. Ms. The vote is a key component, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but can you speak specifically to the postponement yeah. motion right now? I'm getting there. Okay, all right, okay. Just listen okay. to what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Um, so w w what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is by doing that, w what, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I've been trying to do is gather the interests involved. This serves the reasons why we cared about the model. It serves the reasons why people have been concerned. It serves the reasons why Dr. Reed feels this is a good idea. And so... That's why I don't want to postpone this because actually where this originated is in the work session it was a 7-5 vote, right, to maintain this process. I was amongst the seven. There was further conversation. I saw the merits of, number one, giving that respects and, and respect and deference to colleagues. Number two, being more deliberative because if we end up voting for things early in the year, we don't know what's going to change. We don't know how things will adapt. By the time we come to the end where we're talking about the overall superintendent evaluation and we look back and we're like, oh, the majority of the board saw Dr. Reed in compliance on everything. How would it make any sense that at that time, should our perspective change, God forbid, and I know she's gonna be great, but for any superintendent into the future, how would it make sense for us to then change that? It gives more weight to the majority over the dissenting voices, and it doesn't give us the opportunity to potentially course correct down the line 
when we made premature decisions in the, in the beginning. That's what I, th those are merits of what I thought to be a process where we don't have to do the vote, where it sinks it in, it's a record, it's, it's you know, that was, that's what it is, while at the same time having the ability to indicate your vote on a form that serves as a public record. So we're, we're serving all the interests involved here, and if we don't do that, I could always withdraw my vote from the work session. This is where I was trying to be thoughtful here, which puts us at a 6-6 vote, and then ultimately puts us in a place where we have no process. So th that's where I'm trying to come to a place where we're like, okay, this is an alternative process. It works, it makes hopefully everyone happy because you're st we're still following the model and doing what we want, but not imposing the components that felt disconcerting to some members and made them feel they're not fulfilling their school board accountability role. Um, rather than sabotaging the whole thing, ending up at a 6-6 with no process and, and having to have a vote we need to deal with today. That's where I came, that's how I came here. So I really think it's a good idea, guys. I'm not trying to be biased in any way and I don't have a weird intention behind it, which I feel people are responding to without listening to my words. And I hope we can support this. Okay, I didn't necessarily hear anything about the postponement motion. So I'm saying don't postpone. Okay. I'm saying Ms. don't postpone. Cohen, it's fine. Don't postpone Cohen, so that we can support my I, motion. I did get that, but okay, Ms. Cohen. Um, Ms. Setlow, can you just help jog our memories? It's, I know we're getting late here, but my understanding was after we voted to make the form uh, optional, I then posed the question, should we then stop these presentations and stop the process while governance goes back? And the resounding conversation in the room was no. That is my recollection from, from what occurred. So I, I guess I, my confusion is that if the form is already mandatory and we already as a group decided that we weren't going to have the process stop, I guess I am confused about why we wouldn't vote to see if you were in compliance or not. Since I think, I feel like that seems to be a key piece of this strategic governance model is you knowing at each interval if you have met it or not. So, so to me, the postponement is appropriate because I don't, it does not sound to me like we have a clear understanding of what we've already agreed to, so. I obviously will support the postponement. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Marin, did you mean to have it? I did. Okay, go ahead. I did. I just am asking to call the question on this motion. I, I'm, pardon, Madam Chair. I can't. I can't make it clear that I have a question because I was just confused by what was just said. What did you? I can't understand you, Ms. Keys Gamara. Please say it again. It was oh. my understanding. I, I didn't understand. At least I was confused by, I believe that was Ms. Cohen that just spoke. Right. Is that correct? Yes. That, yes. Well, then it was me. Yeah. Just that. Okay. I was, I was confused by her statement of the facts. Okay. okay. I'd like to um, resume my turn. All right. I'd like okay, to. Ms. Marin has called the question. I've called the question, so no. and I. Um, so I, I can't. I don't. Isn't per Roberts' rules when the question is called, okay, we take yes, a vote. Yes. Thank M you. Ms. Keys Gamara, are you, oh, I'm going to turn it over to our parliamentarian. Just make well, sure that I'm you have. Well, I'm not going to vote to close. To, yeah. All right, that sounded like I'm a second. I'm not going to vote to call the question. What did she say? She said I'm not going to vote to close. Question. Okay. Okay, I under, okay can, thank can you. Can I so just clarify, all we're doing is tr some people are trying to convince other people. So This is, okay, Ms. This Ms. is really got to stop. I, I, I call I, the question. I speak to the, to the question. I call the I'm question. I'm not voting and let's to close okay. the question. Ms. Keys Kamara, so Ms. Keys, Ms. Keys Kamara, I just, I just need you for just a second to hold on. Um, 
Ms. Marin has asked that we call the question. Is there a second to calling the question of postponement? That's been seconded. All those in favor? Ms. Cohen, Ms. Marin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Pekarski, and Ms. Kizkamara, you are voting against. All those against? Uh, Ms. Corbett Sand on calling the question. Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernak Koufax, and Ms. Keys Gamara, and Ms. Omesh, we're going to continue debating the point of whether or not we should postpone this uh, motion until the next time we are all together. And with that, turn off your lights. Let's start over. But before we start over, I'll actually take my turn. Um, I but, think. Mi but pardon me, mi Ms. Ms. Pekarski. Ms. Keys Gamara. I, I had. I had asked for a clarification because the, the, the statement that Ms. Cohen made was confusing to me. Okay. And Ms. I, I'm okay. sorry. I'm on the phone. I don't have a way to raise my hand. Yeah, that's okay. I, I, we did not understand what your clarification was. So I think oh, can this, I, can I, go, why don't you go ahead and ask your question then? I believe Ms. Cohen just said that when we voted, the document, filling out the document was mandatory. That was not my understanding. N no, you misunderstood also, Ms. Keys Gamara. Okay. Well, she did not let me say give that. You, let me give you the other. Keep let going. Let me give you the other part that I misunderstood, okay? okay. There was also a statement I thought that we wanted to, we, we decided whether to continue the process or not of getting these reports. I didn't think anyone objected to getting the report. You're right. So you're correct. Um, that is the recollection of a couple of people and our board clerk and Ms. Cohen. Um, she was just asking for clarification. Um, so you're correct. Okay. Okay. I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, where are we? Okay. I'm going to speak to the postponement. I, I am in favor of the postponement. Um, I do find it frustrating that we just had a work session on this. We had plenty of time during the regular day, regular working hours to talk about this. Um, I thought we had come to an understanding and to be bombarded right here and that is the right of anybody to change their mind but it just makes it so unbelievably difficult to move forward um so i would like us to take our time to discuss this to have our chair here to have Ms. keys gamara understanding us in person not on the phone for Ms. sizemore heiser to also come because we are just I, we are just not functioning f as efficiently as I believe we need to be, should be, so we should do this in a more effective, holistic way. Um, and I will speak to the other motion whenever we get to it. Um, I also see Ms. Dernak Koufax wants to speak and then Ms. Corbett Sanders. So Ms. Pekarski, I agree with much of, much of what you had stated. Um, but if you recall, there, it was such a sticky work session, we couldn't even agree whether or not we um, developed a strategic governance model. Um, our chair said we didn't, several people said we did. Um, but I believe Ms. Cohen was absolutely correct in saying, and the chair, the, the clerk's notes also indicated uh, the preliminary minutes indicated that what we agreed to was the form is here, but not everybody wanted to use the form. But Dr. Reed clearly stated during the work session she did not want to stop the work of the board. And so for that reason, we wanted her to provide us with her, you know, executive expectation tonight. Um, all of these motions are confusing, I think, to all of us that where we where we started. I thought at least we were clear on Thursday that those who want to use the form can use the form. Those who don't do not have to, but this will not stop the work 
of Dr. Reed. So I guess I am still perplexed. I mean, obviously I can read this is pretty simple language, but I'm perplexed about why we're going down this road. Okay. Well, do you want her to come back again for your motion? Do you want her to come back again or do you want her not to update this now? That, that one already passed? That one already passed. Now we're, li we're just okay. talking about the postponement to the Abrar Mesh um, motion. Whether or, not we want to pro whether or not we want to postpone the motion, the yes. second motion. Correct. To revise our process so the forms will be optional. And that part is moot because we've already, they already are optional. <laughs> yeah, Steve is so best shaking, shaking her head. Can Still you clarify, me. please? And, and I, I, I appreciate Ms. Omesh, okay. but I would you like don't. to hear from our clerk again. I'm sorry, I missed Donna Kerfax. Could you please repeat? What was stated in the work session about the forms? Were they optional or not? And what was the vote? There were, two vo there were two options given. One, removing the form from the process while the governance committee deals with it. Uh, the individuals who voted th for that were Ms. Omesh, Ms. Keys Gamaro, yourself, Ms. Cor Mrs. Corbett Sanders, and Ms. McLaughlin. The second option was to keep the form while the governance committee deals with it, but with the understanding that all school board members do not have to fill it out. That option was voted for by uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Omesh, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Marin, and Ms. Tolan. And option two had the consensus, so that is what we went with. Are you done, Ms. Danica? I am done. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Frisch. All right, here's my recollection, which tracks closely and I believe if we go back and watch the video God help us all um, <laughs> you'll see that I repeated the motion over and over and over again to make sure that we had clarity the first option was as read you know that we would continue the process without the form and that the governance committee would figure out what to do with the form the second option was the opposite uh, well kind of we, we would continue the process and we would use the form which would be optional I also said in that moment, people are like, well, does that mean the things continue? And that's why the motions are more specific because then I, we went a step further because initially we were just talking about the form. And then I said, okay, because people started to ask questions from their seats, what about the process? Yeah. And that's when I said, okay, option one is to continue the process, the process that we're all sitting here right now in without the form. Option two was to continue the process with the form as optional, well, and both of them while governance committee figures out the path forward. So um, both motions included language that said we would continue the process. I would just like to continue the process while we figure out what to do. And I don't think that we're making our best decisions right now at this dais. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frisch. I think that was very well explained as to what happened. Um, I still see a lot of lights. I will give folks a second to reconsider maybe whether they would like to still speak to their postponement vote. Um, but it'd be great to just kind of see where people are. No. Okay. I will go to Ms. McLaughlin. Mr. Frisch, I really do appreciate you trying to walk through again what was a, a complicated work session for sure. Um, and, you know, what I see here on the motion on the table from um, Ms. Omesh and Dr. Anderson is the second component, that it's a mandatory vote um, on these executive expectations. In the end, um, you know, I, I, I've said to Dr. Reed, uh, this is what she's proposed, that she feels is going to help us as a board and help her in the end. The reality is that eight of us are not going to be here with her, n not even for 
you know, the, the, the final year in review. And so as a result, um, I just hope in the end what we can be doing is in the time we have with Dr. Reed, we give her constructive feedback. And I, for one, um, one minute. Yeah. speak to postpone the to, Oh, so as a result with the postponing of this, if that's going to get us out of this quagmire for tonight, <laughs> then yes, I vote to postpone. That's where I was getting. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. And let's McLaughlin. just move on. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Dr. Reed, as fun as a front row seat is, please feel free to go back to your seat if you would like. Don't feel obligated to stand there. Are we done? Uh, we're not done, but I, if you, it's gonna be a while, I think. We've got some more names. Oh, feel free. Anyway, um, Dr. Anderson followed by Ms. Corbett Sanders. I, I will be very brief. Uh, one, my recollection was not that the form was mandatory, so I'm glad to have received this clarification. Two, I was not, my name was not read off from the votes that you read off, uh, Ms. Setlow. I think Ms. Omesha's name was mentioned twice, whether that was just an error or what the record actually shows, I would like for that to be addressed. Um, and three, I, I'd like to think that this whole conversation began because Ms. Omesh wanted to change her vote. I think that was the long and short of it, and obviously we're in this complicated place. Um, as I said before, I know this is not the post moment, but I won't speak again. I want to have the report. I want to have the feedback. I don't think these votes are necessary because they're not necessarily binding, and the form I don't believe reflects what I think the full board, the full complement on the board, believes it can, um, it can um, be as helpful to you or to the division. Thank you. Ms. Corbett Sanders. So we now know that the first phrase are to revise our process so the forms will be optional. We don't need that. Um, but the second phrase about the mandatory vote, I do want to remind my colleagues, and this is why, um, you know, I. I believe our best work is done when we have conversations with each other and when we have a full discussion. And so if postponing allows for that full discussion, I would support it. But the reason I, I do want to bring, some, bring this to people's attention, no vote is mandatory. Everyone at this board table has the option uh, voting yes, no, or abstaining. And if they believe that their vote does not, they do not have enough information or they don't know how their vote will be used um, or the materials will be used as a result of their vote, then they can abstain. And so um, I will support a postponement. Thank you. Um, Ms. Omesh, did you need to speak again? Um, I wanted to just say, I think we're trying to make this confusing when it's really not. We provide feedback to the superintendent. Ms. We Ms. take notes on postponement, it. Postponement, right? Yes. Okay. We provide feedback to the superintendent. We take notes on it. It becomes public record. She has the chance to work on it, respond to it. We discuss it later. The point I made earlier was that when we take votes, this is, this is more macro than just a board member not doesn't feel comfortable. When we end up taking a vote, majority, you could have seven five every time, and that's not reflective of a board perspective, okay? You end up seven five every time for like every meeting, every like component. When we come to discuss superintendent compliance at the end of the year, and we wanna do an evaluation, and we look back and we're like, oh, the board majority found the superintendent in compliance, in fact, flying colors on everything. What position does that put the five people who might actually wanna find her not, not in compliance? And this is really not about Dr. Reed, actually. I'm thinking more philosophically here. Like, what is a good decision to make here? That, there's no way that those five people are not going to be coerced into like, going with all of that. In addition, how does it make sense for us to find the superintendent in compliance on any of these standards like a month into the year or two months into the year when we're evaluating her on her year's performance? That, that's where the whole idea of having a vote doesn't make sense, and it didn't make sense to a lot of people at the work session. And I think th that's what we're, this is not about just abstaining. We all know that that's always still 
the coercion of the majority that's going to be at play there, and everyone's going to feel bad, and then, you know, whoever abstains is going to look, it's going to be, it's shameful because you're abstaining from something that's your duty. How do you abstain from accountability to the superintendent? You can't do that. So, th again, let's be thoughtful about what's actually constructive here, uh, and, and, and we don't need to postpone this. It really feels like this is where good ideas come to die, because I, I, I suggested something that will meet what everyone is articulating matters, and, and we'll move us forward, but we're just, I don't know, we just want to say no because no. I mean, I, I still don't understand why that, that's not a beneficial piece. And again, we still have our notes on the record um, that will provide her that feedback. And let me just remind everyone, the really stupid part in all of this is if this fails, then I'll just be like, okay, I want to withdraw my vote from the last meeting. Withdraw my vote, we're a 6-6, six, six. we don't have a process. And we don't have a process, we're gonna now move into this executive expectation thing with no determined process. So what are we gonna do? We can't vote tonight on that. Th this is the problem I've been, I told you guys, I've put a lot of thought into trying to avoid. So we could just pick something that is good for everyone and move forward. All right, I'm gonna- Madam Chair, may I make, Madam Chair, I have one last comment. Okay, go ahead. Here's, here's my problem. And, and I, Ms. Corbett Sanders gave a scenario that I have to respectfully disagree with. If we vote, that vote counts. Even if we abstain, it is counted as not voting, which as if we're not sitting here, as if we're not participating in this meeting. And so let's say because I don't feel comfortable sending a message about compliance and not understanding how that's going to be reconciled with the final evaluation, which is not set up in the same, with the same standard as the form that we're being asked to fill out. So let's say I abstain. In July, the board members will look at Karen Keyes Gamara abstain and therefore, she's, her vote isn't counted. And, and, and it passes because I abstain. But at the same time, I don't want to oppose it. But my true objection is that the understanding I need to truly participate isn't here. That's the reason I, can't, I do not want to postpone it because I do think we need to have those genuine conversations so that, so that our participation here is actually meaningful. As it stands, our vote doesn't mean what it need, need, needs to mean because that understanding hasn't been derived. We have not had those conversations. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask our parliamentarian because Ms. Somesh mentioned possibly withdrawing her vote from the work session. Could you please clarify, can she do that? Uh, no. Once a meeting is finished, all the votes that have been taken there are, are final. Uh, only within the course of a meeting can you sometimes go back, reconsider, or change a vote after that the only response is to say move to rescind or amend something previously adopted do something to change things going forward but that would be a new vote you can't withdraw a vote that was already taken thank you i appreciate that so that means that if we vote to postpone this um, we will go back to the process of the night which is what we had agreed upon at our work session and we will take this up at another time at the next meeting. Point of order, Ms. Um, Bukarski. Okay. I, I'd like to understand this better because number one, <laughs> Mr. Morgan, we talked extensively yesterday and arrived yeah. at a different conclusion. Uh, excuse me, this number is not two, a point of order. Thank this you, has Ms. been Mayor. done. No, no, I, this Thank has you, been Ms. done Mayor. at previous meetings, so I would like to okay, I will, pull I'll, the record on those okay. if that's how we're gonna proceed. Okay. Ms. Omesh, we have our parliamentarian by Robert's rules. He is the final well, not, I, I, okay, I'll take that back, whatever. But please, please go ahead, Mr. Morgan, and, um, and, and reply to Ms. Omesh's concerns that this has been done before. I believe that the, what the member is referring to is are uh, instances where a member 
wished to change his or her vote in the course of a meeting and a motion to suspend the rules was used as a shortcut for reconsidering, reopening, revoting. But those cases were within the course of the meeting itself when it was still possible to reconsider uh, the vote on a pending on a, a motion that had been voted on. Okay. All right. With that, we're going to take the. You don't need to talk about it. We're going to take the vote on whether or not we should postpone this motion on the screen in front of you by Ms. Somesh. All those in favor of postponement, raise your hands high. Ms. Cohen, Ms. Merritt, Mr. Frisch. Um, Ms. Darnat Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and me. All those against? Ms. Omesh? I vote against. Dr. Anderson, Ms. Keys Gamara? Um, the motion to postpone passes. We're not going to go back to our regularly scheduled program. I just have to figure out where that is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Frisch, I will call on you for a motion. Thank you. I move that based on the information provided, the board finds the superintendent has reasonably interpreted the provisions of the relevant executive expectation and is in compliance with the emergency superintendent, that is, uh, and is in compliance with EE2 as outlined in the strategic governance manual, EE1 as outlined in the strategic governance manual, which is the global expectation, executive expectation. The words are literally appearing on my screen. We will be better <laughs> with this. Uh, I hope. All right, I'm going to read it one more time. I yes, move that based do. on the information provided, the board finds the superintendent has reasonably interpreted the provisions of the relevant executive expectation and is in compliance with the global executive expectation, EE1, as outlined in the strategic governance manual. Okay. Is there a second? Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch, would you like to speak to this? Yes. If we didn't think that you were in compliance on this, one of a couple things can happen. We can say that you're not in compliance, in which case you would have to come back to us with a corrective action memo where you identify for the board how you are going to get yourself into compliance and get the school division into compliance. The alternative to this scenario is that you take feedback from 12 board members and try to make sense of it yourself with no consensus from the board on what it is that you're supposed to approve, improve, or you know, move on to. If I had a manager, if I had 12 managers, and they would not say for certain what they wanted me to do on my job, I could not perform for them. Conversely, if they said, Based on the report that you've brought us, we think you're doing a great job in one, two, three, and four, um, and we think that you need to improve on number five. And then your 12 managers said, um, we agree. You'd have very clear direction on how to proceed. If we just spoke to, if, if my 12 managers just spoke to me, all at once, maybe they took their turns speaking to me, I would have no way of making sense of what it is I'm supposed to do or whose opinion has weight. Ultimately, it is a majority of the board that's going to make a decision. And so I, I do think that these votes are binding in a sense. They're binding in the moment, right? If we say that you're not in compliance, then you have to come back, and then we decide whether you're in compliance. So they're at least temporarily binding. But there's not a single person on this dais who is going to go to the superintendent's evaluation at the end of this process looking at EE1, for example. Um, and not have opinions about how the superintendent has performed on EE1 throughout the year. It is a snapshot in time. And how the superintendent corrective, uh, corrects courses when we ask them to is what we judge them on when we do our performance evaluation. I want to be held accountable for holding the superintendent accountable in a clear and precise way. No one can function without that kind of management. No one. It doesn't have to be the Carvers. Pick up any management book, any management book, 
The only one that will tell you that that's not the case is the one that says, uh, I don't want to be managed, is the title. I don't think that book actually exists. Um, but in terms of EE1, back out of my little scenario, this is, as Ms. Corbett Sanders said, you know, the big one. And um, I think that these, these um, issues are so big that the way that you prove that you are in compliance is by setting up the structures to measure these huge things. And I will be looking at how those things evolve over the year ahead uh, into your um, performance evaluation. Today, I am more than comfortable voting that you're in compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin, followed by Dr. Anderson. I move to limit debate to one minute. Okay. I'm um, confused. I, I was the seconder. Uh, the oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, no, you're right. I, I will. I'm sorry, Ms. Marin. I've got yeah. the call on my seconder. That's okay. Yes, a second to the motion. Um, you know, I do believe that it is difficult to try something very new and I think this um, has high potential for success but we talked a lot at, at, at the work sessions about maybe some concerns and that's why it's going back to governance um, but at this point in time um, the majority of the board did agree that we would proceed and continue to try and do the work and so I'm seconding the motion because I want to respect with the majority of the board decided at that work session. Um, you know, Dr. Reed, you know how much I value and trust your leadership. Um, you also know that I'm such a big data girl that I, I am struggling a little bit, even though we know it's a snapshot in time. I, I, you know, for tonight, I need to think about how I want to proceed with this one. Um, so I want for the public to know that there is no question that uh, when it comes to having faith and confidence in you as a leader, that is without question. And um, I, I do hope that we will get this ironed out so that uh, we can help everybody be a little more efficient with their time um, tonight and going forward. So I appreciate um, the motion, Mr. Frisch. Okay, great, Ms. Mayor. We want to I move to limit debate to one minute. Okay, is there a second to limit debate to one minute, Ms. Cohen? Um, would also like to limit debate to one minute for each board member. Is that, Mr. Morgan, the process here? Yes. Uh, okay. If that right. was her intent, one minute per board member, then yes. you would just total. have a yes. total. Two, uh, she total. wants, she's saying total though. Total. One minute total, total. per member. Okay. Per member. Are you seconding that, Ms. Cohen? Okay. Um, we need two thirds, right? Two thirds, correct. Okay. No debate. So all those in favor to one minute for each school board member, please raise your hands. That is Ms. Cohen, Ms. Marin, um, all those opposed? Ms. Omesh, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Dernak Kofax, Ms. McLaughlin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Corbett Sanders, uh, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. how do you Keys vote? Ms. Keys Gamara. Okay, Ms. Keys Gamara. I'm opposed. Okay, that, um, that fails and we will go back to our list of folks who'd like to speak, and I have Dr. Anderson. Thank you. I, I think we just spent a lot of time talking about how important this work is, and having such a limited debate just really flies in the face of that. But I do have questions about this, um, and I just want to say, as I shared before, I do have like some concerns about the process, but I want these reports, and I do, I do want to engage in this discussion. Um, I do want to echo what has been shared a little bit by both Ms. Marin and Ms. McLaughlin, which is it would be helpful to have some samples. And I, I see some spaces where maybe that, oh, I see some, um, some areas where that, could, that might be feasible. Um, for example, on page two, you talked about mandatory, um, as the evidence, uh, mandatory trainings and professional development for staff members assigned and monitored, you know, et cetera. It'll be great just to have a few examples of some of those trainings that speak to this um, global expectation. Um, I have a question about the SIP plan. I can't find the page. Yes, um, I think this is on page four. You talked about the SIP plans being aligned um, and aligning processes. Can you speak to the relationship of the SIP plan as it relates to principals, teachers, 
um, LT and all the way up to you? How do you see or how are you going to um, align that so that the work is trickling down to the very people who need to conduct it? So thank you, Dr. Anderson. It's actually an iterative process, so it trickles up and down. Uh, we have a team that includes um, our strategic planning uh, group, as well as our regional assistant superintendents, our chief of schools, our chief equity officer, and chief academic officer that have put together a team uh, to work on the school improvement and innovation plans. We uh, required goal three as a goal that every school in the division responded to, and then uh, schools could pick another uh, goal to be responsive to. So what we know is that everyone's going to be working, I think it's goal three, was that right, Marcy? Okay. Everyone's responding to goal three. So for example, our elementary schools um, across the entire 141 schools are working on making sure our third graders are readers. Uh, we're looking at the eighth grade algebra data point at middle school and robust course taking patterns at high school. And mm -hmm. they can pick another goal to be responsive to. So um, those are turned in to, from the teachers and principals work on those at the school site. And then those are turned into their RASs who review those. And then at senior leadership, we look at those for patterns for resource and support. Um, thank you for that. I, I think I, I may not have asked my question very clearly, but thank you for reiterating mm -hmm. that every, I'm sorry, was there? A... Oh, okay, thank you. I got a uh, piece. Your speaker's still on, Ms. Keys Gamara. Every time I start my second. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this cannot count with my time. Okay. Um, and talk about goal three being the reading goal. I, I guess the granular question that I wanted to ask, does this show up also in the teacher's goal setting? Because I know they have to conduct that with their principals at the start of the year. If that's the school's goal, is it trickled down to the individual teacher's work? Because again, at the end of the day, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the question that I wanted to raise. I have not reviewed teacher goals at this point. Um, I do know that our collaborative teams at the elementary are working on our literacy at the elementary. Um, so I don't know that we're reviewing teacher goals at this point. Uh, but that is certainly, as we roll out a brand new strategic plan, a brand new planning process, an aligned data dashboard, all those pieces will be um, added in. So I don't think we're able to start with everything in perfect place, you know, two months into this. Okay, so that would be a potential next step. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask, I'm glad you brought up data dashboard. I know you have been working with uh, Mr. Sethi to develop some. Is how could we get that embedded here so that we get a sense of that as a measure because that is a second part of this EE? I think we'll have to take a look at those um, and look at how publicly uh, facing the different data dashboards. And I don't think be. it makes sense to, you know, put a data dashboard here, but maybe some parts, maybe sure. snapshots from that yeah. dashboard, just to give an example of the kind of information you're collecting, or even a list of the kind of information that you're collecting and sure. watching on a regular basis. Sure. And then you could just source it, you know, data dashboard number one. I know you have several. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Corbett-Sanders. So I very much appreciate uh, more clarity and actually one of the questions that somebody raised with me earlier today was a teacher who said that they had been told um, that as a result of this new process they did not need to put in individual development goals in their own um, plans and I promise to raise that today, tonight because I know that that is not the intent and we obviously want teachers to have their own personal goals and their objectives. As a result of what new process? They, the principal at a local level told them that they were not, uh, that they were changing the whole process as a result of our strategic plan and our new um, SIP process that there would not be those individual goals or development goals for individuals 
in their own plans. And um, so I would want to explore that a little further, maybe offline. But the goal is really to align our goals, because if we have um, a particular goal the school is working on, for example, and everybody is, has a different goal than that, we're not going to achieve the goal, right? So there has to be an alignment of the work. Um, but how that plays out in the classroom by classroom level, I think would be a good conversation to have. Well, ideally, they all, there's a, um, a line that goes from yes. the overall strategic plan right. to the individual school SIP, and then the school SIP will adopt, for example, I know literacy is a common goal across right. the um, system, so then each individual teacher may have, as part of their development plan, something tied to that literacy piece. That would be my guess as to how that plays out, but I would want to go back and check that. As I mentioned earlier, I, we haven't looked at the, the teacher goal setting yet. At this point, we've been um, retooling some of our evaluation practices here recently. Mm -hmm. So I would just urge that, you know, some sort of communication get okay. out to teachers you on bet. that. Um, I will not, and I don't think this is any surprise, I will not be voting on this tonight. I will be abstaining because I do think, as I mentioned earlier this evening, that this is something that, um, because it's the capstone of the um, executive expectations, it's something that really should come later in the year. But um, I do appreciate this report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I don't see anyone else wishing um, to speak. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and Ms. call. Ms. I'd like to speak. Ms. Omesh. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, the report is uh, thorough, and I appreciated having links to everything and uh, well-documented reporting of your uh, progress. Um, the only thing that I was left thinking about was uh, kind of wanting a, a bit more of a walkthrough of what was and what became over the course of this year, your work. I don't know if you can provide a bit of a narrative of that. I think it would just be helpful because obviously there were things that existed before um, and I have no doubt you've added value. Uh, so I just want to be able to highlight what that was. Okay. Um, let me start. I'll just pick a couple examples from each section, Ms. Omesh. Uh, the requirement of background checks for all new hires, current employees, and volunteers. Uh, we previously were not requiring background checks of current employees. We had previously only required them of new employees. So this is a uh, check-in on our system to require that and maintain the data, which has created um, quite a uh, workload actually for our human resources department. Dr. Wilson has a team. We've ordered uh, mobile fingerprinting so that we're able to go out to schools as well. Um, we had several staff make that suggestion and we're able to have the team deployed because we want to make sure we have all staff on a cycle of background checks to avoid um, any circumstances that might in any way have our students or staff or families not um, safe. Um, we've also worked with, um, if I think about looking at communication plans, major incidents re response trainings um, under public in image or credibility, I think those things were all in place. I think we're making a concerted effort to be out in the community quite a bit to have that back and forth in the total of 87 community meetings last year um, to make sure we're engaging with our community was very important. Uh, the emergency situations, uh, the updating of the red notebooks, the uniform crisis plans and classroom crisis management plans are very important, um, as well as the safety audit, which has just been uh, completed, which I know the board's going to be taking a look at here in the next month or so. Um, the data dashboards are really pretty key, quite honestly. Um, and uh, to Dr. Anderson's point, I think finding a way to include a snapshot of those will be important but we didn't previously have data dashboards on a number of topics. I think they were known at the school level, but not at the division level. So our ability to look across the entire division is critical as we look at allocating resources and providing supports, as well as bringing the work to scale. Uh, because otherwise we end up with um, work that's not necessarily up to scale. 
What's also new is that our departments have goals that will connect to the strategic plan goal, and they have to provide and submit plans, which was not previously, at least wasn't done in the last couple of years. Um, and the leading indicator work uh, so that we can look at what is the data point, for example, graduation rate, on-time graduation rate's important, but a leading indicator is really how our ninth graders are doing. So trying to make sure we're looking at research to identify if we want to make sure we have a great graduation rate, we have to make sure we have a great ninth grade credit um, completion rate and so forth. So those are pieces we're being more explicit and transparent uh, with departments and the division about. So those are a few examples. Thank you so much for, for that outline. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of these you would attribute kind of to ongoing work that um, I guess like uh, came to fruition around this time. And then also if there are things that you planted the seeds for maybe that still haven't, you know. Well, I think we're looking at a number of, um, I think making sure that there's alignment from the boardroom to the classroom is really critical. Looking at needs-based resource allocation in a, um, I think, more um, transparent way, perhaps. Uh, we've looked at after-school programming, for example, in terms of equitable access, uh, making sure we have that access, science Olympiad, math Olympiad, so forth, and those are data dashboards that we are now working on developing because we are large, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have information about what's going on in um, all uh, quarters. But to your other point, a lot of this work has been in place, or and I think the pandemic disrupted some of those structures, um, and we're just now in the place of kind of finishing some of those pieces of work, which I think uh, eliminates that feel of, <laughs> you know how they construct bridges and overpasses on freeways, but sometimes like they go nowhere until they're finished. So I think what we're trying to do is finish some of those so the off ramps and on ramps get done. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. I think it'll be exciting to see how that comes up throughout the year and then right. we'll be able to more f comprehensively eval evaluate that component um, yeah. when the superintendent evaluation comes around. And I'm still, I'm still contemplating, I think the, I think a vote on this is a little bit premature. I, I don't take that to mean any indication of anything about where you are. I'm very happy to hear about all of these and I think they're enough actually of a sign to probably lead us down compliance by the end and, and perhaps even more than compliance. But I think in just trying to be intellectually honest and, and um, have integrity to myself in, in making this decision and not knowing the future, I probably will also abstain but I again want to clarify that that's not a statement either way. I really appreciate all the work you put into this. Yeah, the staff has uh, done quite a bit, yeah. Okay, Thank and you. now with that, I'm gonna call for the vote on the motion, which is on the screen. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Ms. Cohen, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Merritt, um, and myself. All those opposed? All those abstaining, Ms. Gomesh, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Um, Dernat Kofax, Dr. Anderson, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, do you wish to vote Ms. Keys Gamara? Okay, with Ms. Keys Gamara away from the phone. Um, so that motion passes because everybody abstained. Um, thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, um, thank you to my colleagues. Well, of order, I actually yes. do have a question. Okay. I think quorum is required for a vote, right? Like you need the number for quorum to have a vote. We have quorum. No, One, no, two, three. no. Everyone abstained. So okay. if you had four people voting, um, Mr. Morgan, is that a thing? I don't think so. No, you you don't need a you don't need full quorum to actually sure. vote. You just need a quorum present. So the vote is whoever voted. Okay, so that motion did pass. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, colleagues. Well, it has been a hot minute since I was your chair. You all do know how to keep it fun. And with that, uh, Mr. Frisch. All right, uh, the board will now take a 10 minute recess um, uh, and take a few minutes to complete the document um, at their, if they choose to, um, and turn it into the clerk.
We will reconvene in 10 minutes.
but Chris tells her I tried to vote and I couldn't vote. I want to say something. I wanted to make a statement with my vote. I was muted. She had me muted. So when you were calling me, I couldn't speak. The clerk had me muted. So when you were calling me, I couldn't speak. Yes. If board members could return to their seats. Board members, please return to your seats. Board members, please return to your seats. All right, uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask for, uh, without objection, to allow Ms. Keys Gamara to cast her vote. Ms. Keys Gamara for the executive expectation. Ms. Keys Gamara, are you unmuted? She didn't. She didn't. Oh. Ms. Keys Gamara, can you hear us? All right, she's unmuted. Ms. Keys Gamara, would you cast your vote? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to speak. Are I. You uh, you you did speak. We we had I, the vote. Are you voting yes, no, or abstaining? Well, I couldn't do any of that because I was muted. Mr. I President. understand. I'm asking you to provide your vote, and then we'll move on with the rest of the agenda. My vote is my continuing objection because Ms. we Gamara. actually do not. Ms. Keys Gamara. We've already had the discussion on the motion. There's, you, there's no objection yes, to you I casting your vote. Speak. Sir, I could not speak because I was muted. Everybody spoke. This is short. I did not speak to the actual motion. She did actually. I did not speak with respect to the executive expectation where people commented I understand. on what Dr. Reed was. With, without objection, we'll let Ms. Keys Gamara have a minute to speak and to cast her vote. Thank you. I, am, I want to clearly state my continuing objection due to things that I've already explained, especially not understanding how we have a in compliance here and a totally different standard 
for everybody else in FTPS as well as the state objective. I can abstain, but I want it clearly understand, understood that the reason I'm abstaining is I'm not saying that she's not in compliance, but I don't think it's appropriate at this time. Thank you. And Thank we you. do not have a majority because Ms. Amesh already told you she was ready to change the vote. Thank you. All right, the parliamentary has already dealt with that. Ms. Kiskamara has registered her opinion as an, pardon me? I understand the parliamentarian's okay. explanation, Thank but you. it is different when this board understands that that person who voted that made this pass has expressed something different. Thank you. We understand Ms. that now. Thank you, Ms. Kiskamara. Uh, can, you can the clerk record her abstention? It's a recorded. Thank you. All right. One second. The next order of the next order of business is the policy review for Executive Expectation One, Global Ex Executive Expectation. As noted at our September 28th meeting each year, the, the board will review each of the 13 executive expectations uh, at the time the monitoring report is provided to determine if any revisions are needed moving forward. The board may also review any of the executive expectations at any time uh, uh, a change is needed. At this time, board members may provide comments on Executive Expectation 1, Global Executive Expectations, to determine if any revisions are needed. At this time, I now invite uh, board members who would like to suggest revisions to Executive Expectation 1 to make comments. Ms. Tomesh. Your light's on. Okay. Seeing no lights, uh, if there are no further comments or discussion, I now call on Ms. Marin for the motion. I move that the school board maintain Executive Expectation 1, Global Executive Expectation, as it is currently detailed in the Strategic Governance Manual. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to your motion? No, thank you. Ms. Omesh? I guess I just wanted to be clear that the names were randomly assigned here. I guess we're going on a cycle, on a cycle of like what motions are presented, so <laughs> that's why I seconded. Um, but obviously, I know that there is work that needs to be done at the, in the um, uh, governance committee to look at this. We've all agreed on the executive expectations. I think that's a good place that we're at, um, but procedurally, there's more to be resolved. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. All right, we will move on to a vote. All those in favor of maintaining the current executive expectation, uh, let me actually read what it says on the screen. I will now call on a vote on the motion, which is on the screen. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Marin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernett Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, uh, Ms. Kiskamara, are you, would you like to announce your vote? I'm gonna abstain. I, I actually, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, and I will vote in favor. So that is everyone present voting in favor and Ms. Kiskamara uh, abstaining. All right, uh, agenda item 701, uh, action item choosing to move forward with W.T. Woodson High School renaming. I call on Ms. McLaughlin for a motion. I move that the board vote to proceed with the name change for W.T. Woodson High School. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. McLaughlin, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, yes, my colleagues. Um, I do want to um, share with you that um, I deeply appreciate um, the fact that uh, approximately 1,400 members of our community, from alumni to parents and guardians to students and staff and community, um, did go online um, to share their feedback about this decision. Uh, looking at the two key stakeholders, um, it was uh, roughly about um, the two largest groups were basically our, our alumni and our parent um, guardian community. When you break out where the um, feedback was in support of the name change, about 27% of our alumni um, considered uh, supporting uh, this change. Um, 
59% of those respondents who identified as families and guardians, and 54% of the category that included our students and staff and community members. Um, as I have shared during the forum topic, as I've shared um, in our public discussions, and as I shared during the community meeting where we had about uh, 60 people come, uh, I recognize uh, that one of the great strengths about Woodson High School is the immense amount of pride uh, that the community feels for it, um, as well as its 60-year uh, reputation of high academic excellence and uh, the immense community engagement. And as I also have shared um, numerous occasions, um, I certainly do not take lightly um, this vote before us tonight uh, as a two-generation Woodson family, um, a resident and homeowner. Uh, I continue to hold incredible pride for the school and to be a part of this community. Um, but I also hope that in our community conversations with each other um, and having spoken with leaders of our athletic boosters, with our PTSO leaders, with our student leaders, uh, that there has been um, quite an understanding that as we identified those historical documents about where former Superintendent Woodson stood on the issue of segregation versus integration of our schools, it's simply time that uh, we recognize that um, as a board and a body, we know how important it is to have names on a building that can inspire um, all students and uh, our staff and our community. And so I now hear the bell going off on me, which, uh, wow, okay. So uh, I guess what I would say um, is I will need to go back. But in the meantime, my colleagues, uh, I do hope that um, in light of the feedback, when we look at where the community is, I think it's understandable um, that it's always difficult um, for change. Um, and I do believe that um, in my go back, I can talk a little bit more on why I still believe proceeding with the name change is the right thing to do. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Omesh? Yeah, I'm happy to follow Ms. McLaughlin, and I do want to thank her for uh, all the work she's put into this up to this point. I know she's spent many, many hours uh, gathering consensus in the community um, and attending various functions as well on our behalf. So um, obviously I'm, I'm excited that we're here. I think it took listening to students, and it's always the power of students that, you know, awakens our consciences as well to make sure that we do this. Um, and I think it's just symbolic, you know, we spoke to this a little bit during forum, but um, that perhaps we can say the mistake of uh, W.T. Woodson was being complicit in, uh, in when systems around him were unjust, and by doing so, he maintained the status quo, which meant he was an actor with it in the oppression, um, even though it might not seem active, depending on um, how you look at the past. But, uh, and I think that that's the statement we're making today, right? That, that being complicit isn't okay. That when segregation, oppression of all forms is happening around us and we maintain that status quo, that that's not good enough. And I think that it's symbolic that we're, tr we're deciding now to not maintain that status quo by making this change. And I think that speaks to the legacy of this decision uh, and will hopefully be a step in the right direction. And, and I say that also wanting to say that I think it's also important for us to hold space for people who may be confused or unsettled by this decision too. Um, I think people carry emotional attachments to the names of the schools they went to. Uh, and I know we heard some dissenters who came forward and I don't, I, I wanna make sure that the message is loud and clear that you haven't been um, ignored and I hope not dismissed. Um, but we're certainly listening to as many people as we can and hopefully making decisions um, that have the far future in mind as well. So, um, it, you know, I, it's just important to me to say that because I think we tend to lean into a righteous corner um, that is dismissive of those who have different perspectives, even if that is something we feel strongly about. 
So I'm looking forward to leading this. I feel really bad that Ms. Karim uh, is not here. I know she wanted to stick around for this. She is a Woodson student and has been leading a lot of the student uh, voice in this. Um, but hopefully we'll get to hear from her as well in the coming weeks and months. And I know that we still have to hear from the community about the name choices and whatnot, which we saw some of in the presentation today. But again, just want to thank my colleagues for their collaboration on this. And Ms. McLaughlin, I know you've been putting in a lot of this and hope to continue working with you on it. Thank you for me mentioning our student rep, Ms. Uh, Amesh. She said on her way out that she would <laughs> like to have been here, but she has some academics she has to focus on in the morning and can't do her best work if she's not rested. So um, we have no other lights, so I'm going to take a turn since I represent a, a good portion of uh, the community um, and say, uh, you know, the process is designed to be deliberative, right? It's two phases. Each one of them engages the community. Each one of them has a public hearing. Um, and obviously the website uh, is open. Um, and the way in which Ms. McLaughlin has approached this has been collaborative as well. I believe the forum was sponsored by half the board, right? Several of us have students there, plus the at-larges. Ms. Amesh, I believe your brother went to Woodson? So both, both. Yeah. both. Um, and so the board has lots of connections to the school um, and um, half the board took the first step um, in, in moving this process forward so that the community could be engaged. So I look forward to the next phase, which um, I think you'll be talking about a little bit in your, your go back. So I will segue to that and let you have your go back, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Um, I do want to just give a little more context, especially for the community who may be watching, um, that as Dr. Reed um, in her presentation, having captured the community feedback that we have received to date. So again, there's gonna be another full um, uh, 28 days that uh, the community will again now um, be able to provide feedback should we decide at this time to vote um, to change the name. So it is a two-part process. Um, I do want to um, just add a little bit more that in some of the uh, comments section that we received, uh, that uh, respondents were concerned about what the cost might be. Um, they were concerned that um, the, as alumni, they have a very strong connection to the existing name. And that for especially um, a number of our earlier alums where uh, Mr. Woodson was a, a very frequent presence, having retired but being a member of the community, he was often at many sporting events. And uh, so he was personally known by uh, some of the uh, older alumni who um, just remember their positive interactions with him. And so uh, I really appreciate Ms. Amesh you capturing the, the sensitivity that I think we all feel um, for our alumni and uh, you know, without question, that is what we have continued to, to keep in mind and listen to. Um, and interestingly, in terms of the feedback to date, um, the highest number of support we've seen is for the name Carter G. Woodson um, with more than 450 people um, strongly saying support for that name. The next closest one was to um, just call it Woodson High School, simply call it Woodson High School, and that was 42 people. Um, and then after that, there was only about uh, five names where they got four to nine votes. Um, and beyond that, then there was about 300 individual singleton suggestions. So lots of different thoughts that people had. Um, but this, as I said, uh, was meant to um, just, again, help the community know where the board was coming from. And uh, so I do hope that with great humility and sensitivity um, that our board will unanimously support this first stage of the process to vote to rename Woodson High School. And that, uh, again, with care and deliberation, uh, we will then begin and embark on the next phase. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Seeing no other lights, uh, we will go ahead and take the vote. I will call for a vote on the motion, which is on the screen. All those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> Ms. Cohen, uh, Ms. Omesh, um, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Dernat Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, and myself, uh, Ms. Kiskamara.
she, she's unmuted, so you can, Ms. Kiskamara, will you cast your vote? Yes, I'm supporting the motion, but I tried to raise my hand. Can you see that? Yes, I didn't know you could do that. Would you like to speak? Okay. Nope, I'm good. Oh, okay, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Actually, so Mr. Frisch, I'm sorry, point of privilege, Ms. Kareem did send me her remarks. I don't yeah. know if it's worth reading them on her behalf, but she felt strongly yes. about this. Okay. Uh, well, no upset. Sorry. Okay. All right. That's fine. Uh, so uh, the vote was everyone at the meeting and Ms. Kiskamara voting in the affirmative. No abstentions, no opposition. Ms. Amesh? Okay. So this is the student rep, Ms. Kareem. I'm just the messenger. As many of you are aware, the upcoming vote on the Woodson name change is on the agenda for this evening. As a fellow student from Woodson, I want to express my gratitude for the chance to connect with student representatives from clubs, sports teams, and other organizations to discuss the name change. While W.T. Woodson may have made contributions, it's essential to acknowledge what his influence didn't, that his influence didn't reach everyone. Woodson's historical support for segregation is recognized among students, and it has led to a strong desire for a name change. During the segregation era, African Americans faced immense challenges and injustices. In 2023, it is our collective duty to distance ourselves from any remnants of a segregationist mindset and uphold the principle that all individuals are equal. Following numerous student meetings, it is clear that most students support, most students support the name change, viewing it as a crucial step towards fostering a more inclusive environment. By aligning with goal number two in our strategic plan, which envisions every student will experience an equitable school community, one moment, where student health and well-being are prioritized and student voice is centered. Our decision to proceed with the name change will serve as a testament to our dedication to achieving goal number two. Woodson's mission statement is to empower community, our community to reach their individual potential by creating a healthy environment of mutual respect, responsibility, equity, and inclusion. Moving towards the name change will help us create that healthy environment of inclusion and demonstrate our ongoing commitment to building a welcoming community. The potential of renaming our W.T. Woodson represents a significant step towards justice and unity. It serves as a reminder that our present should not be constrained or defined by the past. And a new school name would embody the strength of our community, our compassion, and a belief in our commitment to providing for each student, irrespective of their background. It acts as a celebration of diversity and a pledge to honor the numerous voices that history silenced unjustly. Through the renaming, we begin on a journey towards a brighter, more inclusive environment where the lessons of history bring us towards a more compassionate and understanding future. Uh, just one second, I want to make sure. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude for the dedication and effort put into this matter by school board members, FCPS leadership, and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. Uh, our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many, listed, uh, many items listed have gone through uh, board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. <laughs> items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. The consent agenda has been posted on the screen. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, no objection. The consent agenda is approved. Agenda item nine, new business. The following items uh, are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these items this evening, but action is scheduled for a future meeting. The new business items are on the screen. There are no, uh, I will call uh, on Ms. Darnak Kofax for an audit committee report. Thank you. The audit committee was held October 4th. At this meeting, we welcome two new citizen members, Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Krishnan. We reviewed the Office of the Auditor General's um, team's roles and responsibility. We reviewed our continuous monitoring report of our ESSER three funds. And we reviewed for the first time the employee evaluation process audit which um, evaluated existing processes, evaluated the process, how the process is managed at, at the department's offices and schools and benchmark processes used by other districts to identify best practices. And we were given the quarterly status of what, uh, where we are with our audit recommendations. To my colleagues, I provided the details of you to this meeting in the email on October 5th and particularly with the employee evaluation process. I think you should find that interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darnett Kofax. 
Agenda item 11 is board matters. Without objection, we would like to not have board matters this evening. No objection. The meeting is adjourned. Too late. <laughs>